The second book. Put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and cry. Come out of her, my people. Sequel. Chapter 1. Direction Setting. This book, Put a Mark on the Forehead of Those Who Sigh and Cry, is the sequel to Come Out of Her, My People. Here, we discuss how to understand the factual data from the previous book, how to apply it to our lives, and how to live a life called forth by God for us to come out and carry the torch of revival. Thus, it must be noted that the text refers to come out of her, my people whenever the previous book is mentioned. In the previous book, we studied and discussed where we must come out from when God calls us to come out of her, my people. Revelation 18 verse 4 states, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. First, her refers to God's calamity in the last days. Because the Bible tells us that in the last days all people will be punished except those who have the seal of God on their foreheads, Revelation 9 verse 4, that her from Revelation 18 verse 4 refers to the place where those who are not sealed by God and those who have received the mark of the world will eventually receive their punishment. Second, her is the power that persecuted and killed Jesus, as well as those who loved Jesus throughout history described in the Gospels, Acts, and Revelation. This is the power that continued to rule, persecute, and execute our ancestors of faith. So, in the end, those influenced by a her are subject to destruction and punishment. This could be confirmed with great accuracy and clarity through the Reformer's proclamation, their interpretation of the Bible in the prophetic books, and the proclamation of the words of Revelation. The persecution and oppression of the Roman Empire from the time of Jesus continued with the Roman Church, which further persecuted and executed countless martyrs. Therefore, Satan, the enemy of God, is expressed as Rome in the writings of the Reformers. Third, her is a greatly influential power with an entire network that is created by joining hands with many people, countries, groups, religions, denominations, and churches around the world through the Roman Church that historically has continued its reign through Rome's government. Even in the future, Satan will use Rome which has the power to influence the whole world, and any possible willing power to cooperate. Eventually, everyone who has joined will share the sins of Rome and receive the same punishment. Only those who are sealed by God will be those who do not belong to her. Thus, all people, except those who are sealed by God, will receive the punishment of God and be destroyed. Fourth, her is the beast, the harlot, and the antichrist mentioned in the Bible. Through the content of the previous book, we learn from the works of the reformers that the objects of God's judgment, the beast, the harlot, and the antichrist are historically Roman dominion from the Roman Empire to the Roman Church. We were able to confirm it with certainty through the evidence of historical records and cited texts. We also experienced the fulfillment of prophecies confirming the reign of Rome from the Roman Empire to the Church of Rome, explaining that Rome is in fact the object of God's wrath, as spoken of in the Bible. In accordance with the interpretation of the books of the prophets of the Reformers, it was confirmed that the object of God's wrath, the time allowed for them, and the schedule for them to continue the name of Rome were also perfectly adapted. By comparing the messages of the ancestors of faith with the Bible, we were able to more clearly discern the words of prophecy spoken throughout the Bible. Since the message of the Bible is consistent with history, it is a message that confirms the words of our ancestors who risked their lives to preserve their faith. It is a certain fact that no one can deny or contradict.
Furthermore, it was the content that was found and confirmed by reading the original text from the 1500s to 1800s that remained among the burnt and discarded writings left by the persecutors. Through the content of our ancestors who believed that the Word of God warned us of the last days, it was an opportunity to clearly bring to light what we must reject and resist. However, we cannot help but wonder the need or benefit of knowing in detail about the objects and the forces of darkness. We might think that it would be enough to serve God well by doing good things and being jealous of Him, and we may wonder what would be the purpose of becoming so aware of knowing the power of darkness. But our purpose in knowing is not to oppose and fight against the forces that God will judge. Rather, that is for God to do and will do in His time. However, by exploring the history of the forces of darkness through the previous book, we confirm that their influence extends far beyond all people, all churches, and all religions. In order to obey the word of God that says, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, we want to know where and how to come out from. We want to discern how we are to come out of her by knowing her influence in our lives. Throughout the previous book, we shared the messages of revival as we learned historical facts. Revival is the only way to live a victorious life against dark forces in the last days. We live in an age in which the forces that oppose God want us to perish, making as many people as possible belong to themselves, while God wants the people who love Him to belong to Him so that they cannot perish but rather have eternal life. However, the only way to belong to the side of God is through revival. So it is not about focusing on pointing out the problems of the power of darkness, but rather knowing the darkness is the purpose of discernment. It is after discerning, where we examine ourselves and decide to live a life that is not lived by us, but through Christ who lives in us. This is the purpose and direction of this book. Chapter 2 Understanding the Antichrist In order for us to come to God and emerge from all the influences of the dark powers as God wants us to, it is necessary to properly diagnose ourselves, repent, and make a decision according to that diagnosis. It is something everyone knows and seeks to do, but it does not actually happen as we think and say. Everyone talks about the need for change by addressing issues and raising questions about the current state of Christianity, but in the end, it is not put into practice, and nothing changes. In doing so, I realize that our misconceptions and misunderstandings of God and the Word of God have created an obstacle to know, understand, and love the true God. Therefore, we have not been able to live our lives by making the correct decisions that allow us to live our lives in the most valuable way with the proper discernment. As a result, it was impossible for us to become light and salt in this world. Since we were neither light nor salt, it became a situation where we lived without realizing that we were mixed with darkness. The important thing for us to do to come out of the influence of darkness with the right judgment is to investigate our misconceptions and misunderstandings and rebuild them with the right ones. Throughout the previous book, God explained to us very clearly about the Antichrist, while proving it with certainty through cited texts. However, our understanding of concepts and notions regarding the Antichrist is flawed. We always try to understand and judge the situation by focusing on external factors rather than the internal factors which define it. When we picture the Antichrist, we have the idea that the Antichrist is something to fear. It is depicted with scary images from horror movies with supernatural elements that fuel its power. 
In its original language, Greek, the Antichrist is Antichristos where anti means against, instead of, and Christos is Christ. Therefore, the meaning of Antichrist is the one who opposes Christ or the vicar of Christ who represents Christ. We can learn more about the meaning of the word Antichrist by looking at the Bible verses in 1 John and 2 John where this word is used. 1 John 4 verse 3 And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. It is described that all the spirits that do not recognize Jesus who came in the flesh are the spirits of the Antichrist. It is also explained that anything that does not belong to God is the spirit of the Antichrist. It also says that at that time, there were those who opposed the Lord without admitting that Jesus is the Christ. 1 John 2 verse 22 who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. In 1 John 4 verse 3 it explained that all the spirits that do not belong to God and that do not confess Jesus are the spirits of the Antichrist. Also, in this verse it is explained that those who deny that Jesus is Christ are expressed as Antichrist. It depicts that those who deny the Lord, who is the Son and Christ of God the Father, are liars and antichrists. 2 John 1 verse 7 For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. What we can understand from this verse is that those who do not confess that the Lord who came in the flesh is Christ, are deceiving people, and there are many such deceivers in the world. It is also explained that those who deceive are antichrists. 1 John 2 verse 18 Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Consistent with what 2 John 1 verse 7 said, there are many deceivers who do not confess that the Lord who came into this world is Christ. This verse also says that there are many antichrists with such a characteristic. It also explains that because of the existence of the antichrist, we know that these are the end times. The four verses above are all verses in the Bible that use the word antichrist. What we can learn from these verses is that Antichrist, as the word expresses it, is used for all forces that oppose Christ. That is, the forces that oppose Jesus Christ have been there since Jesus came to this world. So Jesus came to this world in the last days, and in the last days, the forces of Antichrist lie, oppose Jesus Christ, and deceive those who believe and follow Jesus Christ. The reason we need to know how to define and characterize the Antichrist is so that we do not fall into delusion and remain in the faith with the right judgment, because they deceive those who want to come to Christ. In this age, God's will for us is to know those who lie, deceive, and make us stumble, not belong to them and come out of their influence so that we do not participate in their sins and their punishment. Chapter 3 Jesus' Prophecy About the Antichrist Based on the biblical concept of the word Antichrist, I thought it would be important to take a close look at the influence of the dark forces that we were not aware of by focusing on what Jesus said about the forces that oppose God. Hence, it is necessary to learn how Jesus has treated those who oppose Jesus, who is Christ. First, I decided to find out what to find those who oppose Jesus. When discovering who was against him, Jesus said, Be careful. In the Bible, the words of caution are described with the Greek words, prosecho, 
Vlipo, Oreo, which are translated into English as beware. So among all the verses in which these Greek words have been used, the verses that ask us to be careful with ourselves have been removed. All the verses where Jesus points out on the subject that we should be careful of opposers have been put together. Matthew 7 verse 15 Beware of false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Matthew 16 verse 6 Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew 16 verse 11 how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Mark 8 verse 15 Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Mark 12 verses 38 and 39 Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes, who desire to go around in long robes, Love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts. Luke 12 verse 1 In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke 20 verse 46 Beware of the scribes, who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts. Those mentioned in Jesus' words as someone to watch out for were the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herod, and the scribes. Much of the content of the Gospels of the Bible also describes that Jesus was persecuted by them and thus, was ultimately crucified and died. Even Jesus did not treat them with a kind and generous attitude. Rather, he cursed them with harsh words and said to them, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? The whole chapter of Matthew 23 is about the curse that Jesus imposed on the Pharisees and Sadducees, and in many parts of the Gospels, we can find content where Jesus curses and opposes them. So I decided to look for the connection between the objects that Jesus resisted slash cursed in the Gospels and those that will be judged when Jesus returns. In chapter 38 of the previous book, we analyzed commentaries on the books of the prophets and Revelation. Written during the height of the persecution, we sought analyses with the hope that we could understand the perspective of the reformers as the focal point of punishment in the end time. We looked at the contents of the harlot, the beast, and the antichrist, meaning the enemy of God in the book of Revelation. We further looked at the Bible verses which delineate associations between the Antichrist and him. These are the following verses. Revelation 16 verse 6 For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. For it is their just due. Revelation 17 verse 6 I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Revelation 18 verse 24 And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. Revelation 19 verse 2 For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. What we shared in that chapter was that no one can deny that God would bring justice to those responsible for the shedding of the innocent blood of God's children. That is, when Jesus returns, the people who will be judged and punished will be the ones who killed and persecuted the servants, saints, and prophets of Jesus. We further discussed that since we know that Rome is the subject of such offenses, which is evident in history, there is no reason for us to share in their sins and share the punishment they deserve. 
However, it was found in the Gospels that Jesus had already prophesied about this justice. Matthew 23 verses 29 to 36 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. 1. Serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? As previously mentioned above, the entire chapter of Matthew 23 is the curse of Jesus on the scribes and Pharisees. In this chapter, Jesus referred to the scribes and Pharisees as serpents and a brood of vipers. Furthermore, Revelation 12 verse 9 describes, Serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Also, in the original language, viper is echidna, which expresses a malicious desire to change the truth into a lie by spreading deadly poison. Jesus proclaimed that the scribes and Pharisees, described as serpents and the brood of vipers, are her from the Bible. Specifically, the her whom we are warned to. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Her, who are those who cannot escape the judgment of hell? 2. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. This verse is a prophecy from Jesus regarding what they will do in the future. Because Jesus spoke to them using the future tense that they will kill, crucify, and scourge in their synagogues and persecute the prophets, wise men, and scribes sent by Jesus. This means that from our previously mentioned words of revelation, those who shed the blood of saints and prophets are ultimately the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that Jesus cursed in Matthew 23. It was a prophecy that the authority of the hypocrites would eventually become the authority that would continue to kill the saints and servants of God. 3. On you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. This verse expresses how the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites will be judged upon Jesus' return to the world. It will be they who will kill the prophets and scribes sent by Jesus and their accumulated sin of shedding righteous blood as the cause of Jesus' vengeance upon them. So in the end, they will be responsible for the righteous blood shed on earth meaning that the authority of the hypocrites will be responsible for the blood wrongfully shed on earth. What we learn from the scripture is that the object to be judged upon Jesus' return is not new or mysterious. The Antichrist, rather, is the object that Jesus has already clearly explained and revealed. It is clear that those who oppose Jesus and persecute the saints and his servants are the Antichrist. In the following chapters, we will discuss how the authority of the hypocrites, characterized as the scribes and Pharisees of the time of Jesus, will historically continue their authority and ultimately come to fruition upon the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. Chapter 4 All these things will come upon this generation.
In the last chapter, it was clearly delineated that the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites are the ones who will kill and crucify the prophets and the scribes sent by Jesus, scourge them in the synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. Matthew 23 verses 33 to 35 Serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. However, there is something that is difficult to understand. My difficulty in understanding stems in how the hypocrites, the scribes and Pharisees, and those who will be judged in the end times, are connected in time or in authority. When I read the very next verse, my question was answered. Matthew 23 verse 36 Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. However, to understand this passage, we must first understand the meaning of the word generation. Jesus used the word generation several times in the Gospels. When he used the words of this generation, I thought he was referring to the time in which Jesus lived. But if we try to understand the word generation from the perspective of time, the words of Jesus do not make sense and do not fit the situation. Luke 11 verse 29 And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Does he state that only the current generation in his time was the evil generation? Mark 8 verse 12 but he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Not everyone in that generation was asking for a sign. Instead, the Pharisees were the ones asking for a sign from Jesus. Luke 11 verse 50 that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. If solely the generation of Jesus' time is responsible for the bloodshed of all the prophets from the foundations of the world, does this mean that the prior or future generations will not be held accountable? Matthew 23 verse 36 Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Does this mean that all responsibility and punishment will fall only on those who lived during the time of Jesus? Matthew 24 verse 34 Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Mark 13 verse 30 Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Luke 21 verse 32, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the verses above were confirmed three times regarding the great tribulation of the last days. On the other hand, if he states that the great tribulation will pass away before the end of that generation, what does this entail for the generations after Jesus? Will there be no tribulation? Using the previous verses to understand the word generation in a temporal sense, it is difficult to recognize what generation Jesus spoke of. When I checked the meaning of the original word generation or genia in Greek, I found that it has to do with the meaning of race, tribe, group, etc. So when Jesus spoke of this generation to the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, he referred to the authority of the group of hypocrites. Therefore, 
The answer to the question of how the curse is placed on the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, can be connected to the forces of the Antichrist. These forces are driven by the authority established by the hypocrites that will continue until the last days and to the end of the world, forming the group of hypocrites. In particular, the connection between the authority of the hypocrites and the overall forces of the Antichrist answers how the curse placed upon the group will continue to be judged. It is the continuing authority of the group of hypocrites which answers the question. Because the authority of the group will continue to exist, those who will be judged in the end are the people in the overall authority of the group of hypocrites. When I recognized and continued to read over the words that used the word generation, I could now clearly understand the words of Jesus. Generation in this sense is not temporal. Meaning, it is not limited to time. Rather, the term spans over the authority of the group of hypocrites as a generation of itself. Luke 11 verse 50, That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. The meaning of this verse explains that since the beginning of the world, those who will bear the blood of all the prophets will be under the authority of the group of hypocrites. Speaking towards the future, Jesus spoke in the future tense to underline those who held responsibility for the bloodshed in the following timely generations. Matthew 23 verse 36 Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. People who oppose Jesus, led by the power of the Antichrist and the authority of the group of hypocrites, used that authority over the power of Rome to kill Jesus, Jesus' disciples, and the saints of the early churches. The authority found in the reign of the Roman Empire continued to the Roman Church, and led by the authority of the group of hypocrites, the Roman Church historically killed many people who love God. This is why Jesus spoke of the hypocrites who will be judged upon his return in the last days. Matthew 24 verse 34, Mark 13 verse 30, Luke 21 verse 32. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. From the literal translation of the original language, these verses mean that this generation will not be exhausted until everything is complete. Mentioned three times in the Gospel, the importance of the meaning lies in the fact that the authority of the hypocrites will continue up until the Great Tribulation and the fulfillment of all end-time events. Even from a historical point of view, the power of hypocrisy and persecution of the saints and servants of God by the authority of the hypocrites continues to persist. Thus, the authority of the hypocrites is the power that resists Jesus and his people who continue to love God until Jesus' return and final judgment. The power that opposes Jesus in the form of hypocrisy is the power of the Antichrist. Drawing on the fact that the Antichrist is not accurate to how it is pictured in society, there now is a clear distinction between its visual representation and its true identity as a force that transcends timely generations. It is not only a force that opposes Jesus and his loving followers, but also a force that deceives many people and makes them belong to their authority by their means of hypocrisy. In the following chapters, we will uncover the contents of the Bible to better understand the properties of the hypocrites in order to examine ourselves so that we do not fall into their delusion and completely be detached from their influence. Chapter 5 Hypocrisy The understanding of the Antichrist has become clear. But now I feel it would be necessary to further learn about hypocrisy. After realizing that the authority of the hypocrites and the power of the Antichrist are directly related, it is necessary to have an accurate understanding of the hypocrisy that Jesus continually pointed out to those who opposed him. 
In Matthew 23 alone, Jesus spoke. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Six times. Also, in Luke 12 verse 1 Jesus warned. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. By defining the sin of the Pharisees as hypocrites. Therefore, it would be necessary to closely and carefully look into hypocrisy due to his constant warnings. A hypocrite is hypocritus in the original language, meaning a person who pretends. Because it originates from an actor wearing a mask, it expresses the difference between the outward appearance and the inner heart. This is why Jesus also said in Matthew 15 verses 7 to 8, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This means that they do not honor God with their hearts, but they express their honor to God solely with their words. I decided to investigate why people who lead with hypocrisy differ in mind and actions. However, the reason has already been explained many times through Jesus' words regarding hypocrisy. Matthew 6 verse 1 Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Matthew 6 verse 2 Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Matthew 6 verse 5 And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Matthew 6 verse 16 Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. In order to be seen well by people and to be recognized and glorified by them, hypocrites decorate themselves more outwardly and perform plays that allow them to be perceived as better people. Regarding such actions, Jesus has just shown us how to avoid hypocrisy. Matthew 6 verse 6 But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Matthew 6 verses 17 to 18 But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, to avoid hypocrisy, the Bible teaches us that we should not try to be seen by humans, but rather we should try to be seen by an omniscient God who sees in secret. After all, Hypocrisy is not living in God's eyes, but rather living consciously of how people see us. My first thought was who could be free from this sin of hypocrisy. In the human mind, there is a fear that we become a nothing or beings without value. Wherever we are, in any situation, we want to become something of value instead of the existence of a nothing. Our desire to become something how through the recognition of people regarding one's worth is an expression of our fear that becoming nothing that has no value is not recognized and is not exalted. So everyone in this world is constantly seeking to be in the state of something rather than nothing to avoid situations where existence feels worthless as if they are nothing. Even when we go to church and live our lives in faith, we work endlessly to be recognized as a valuable person so that the value of our existence is recognized while doing so. The church is an important place to increase the value of such an existence. This is because church is a place where we can be seen as worthy of recognition while doing good deeds, studying the Bible, praying, fasting, etc.
The church's leadership hierarchy is designed in stages in relation to people's devotion alongside their value of recognition. It is a place where those who feel they are nothing admire and envy a respectable title or position. With the growing influence and number of churches and religious organizations, more coveted positions are created for people's recognition and admiration. These are words of Jesus that are addressed to those who have such aspirations. Mark 12 verses 38 to 40 Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes, who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Luke 16 verse 15 And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. John 5 verse 44 How can you believe, who receive honor from one another, and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? These verses teach us that the heart that does not live in the eyes of God, but lives consciously of how others recognize and perceive us, is the heart that God hates. It is a heart that cannot have true faith because it is a serious sin that will result in severe punishment. Jesus gave a stern warning against hypocrisy telling the group of hypocrites that they would not escape the judgment of hell and repeated several times, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! The sin that has been commanded us to be careful of so countlessly is not murder or adultery, but rather hypocrisy, which no one in this world can be completely free from. It requires a life that lives apart from being conscious of human eyes and instead lives before the eyes of God, not expecting to be recognized by humans, but rather seeking God's approval. I thought it would be impossible for us to live such lives with human strength. I thought that God works on God's salvation with things that only He could do so that no one could boast about it. I am convinced that when I become nothing but through contrite prayers of repentance, be humbled, and ask that only the Lord be everything, the power of God will make it possible to live only in the eyes of God who sees in secret. Chapter 6 Hypocrisy and Fear In the last chapter, we discussed that hypocrisy is not living in the sight of God but rather living consciously of human eyes. After all, Jesus explained in great detail regarding the difference between those who live in the eyes of God and those who live consciously in the eyes of men, hypocrites. Luke 12 verses 1 to 5 In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear and inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear, fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell, yes, I say to you, fear him. In Luke 12 verse 1, Jesus tells the people, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He says there is nothing covered or hidden that will stay concealed. So no matter how hard people try to hide or cover themselves internally, their true characteristics will be uncovered eventually. He then immediately spoke about fear. No matter how much we fear people, they can only kill our bodies. God has the power to throw us into hell. Therefore, 
he said not to fear men, but to fear God. Namely, the means of judging whether a person is a hypocrite or not is through fear. In other words, those who live before God know that God has control over their soul in every moment. They fear the invisible God more than the visible people of the world. In this way, we can judge hypocrisy by looking at the source of fear in a person and see whether they fear men or God. There are so many verses in the Bible that tell us to not to fear men. Psalm 56 verse 4 In God, I will praise His word, in God I have put my trust, I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Deuteronomy 7 verse 21 You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. Psalm 3 verse 6 I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Psalm 23 verse 4 Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, our rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 27 verse 1 The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 56 verse 11 In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It is only possible that the visible world and its people are not the object of our fear. The invisible God becomes the object of our fear when we so surely believe in the kingdom of the eternal God. It becomes clear how much more valuable and important eternal life is than our time in this short world. In other words, it is impossible without faith. Hence, the reason we become hypocrites is because of our lack of faith, disbelief in the eternal world, and great fear of worldly elements that have priority over God. If we understand the object of our fear, then we will be able to determine whether we are a hypocrite or a person living by faith. Because fear is directly related to our faith, the importance of the fear of God is discussed throughout the Bible. Proverb 1 colon 7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverb 19.23 The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction, he will not be visited with evil. Psalm 25 verse 12 Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. Psalm 34 verse 7 The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 115 verse 13 He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Since the fear of God without fear of the world is the foundation of all wisdom, and it is the way to avoid hypocrisy and the way to live by faith, Satan disturbs us in various ways to prevent us from living a God-fearing life. One of them is increasing fear of the world and making people choose the world over God. John 12 verses 42 to 43 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. These verses speak of fear associated with being excommunicated from the world, so despite believing in Jesus, they chose to fear the world rather than to fear God. When the Roman Catholic Church executed people throughout the Inquisition, they aimed to make people tremble with fear and submit to the authority of the Roman Church. It was not the subject of their faith, rather, that drove their conquest. Subject to punishment, martyrs who did not succumb to their power were brutally executed on an execution table highly placed in the middle of a large crowd. It is a scheme to increase the fear of the world so that people choose the world over God. In that situation, however, 
The saints who love God chose not to fear anything but the God who claims our eternal life. One of Satan's other schemes to prevent people from fearing God is to have him be perceived as a God not to be feared. In this way, Satan aims to make God a being who always hears our prayers, helps us in all our difficulties, forgives us every time we sin, and treats us with the same kindness in every situation. It is a life of faith in the form of enjoying God according to our needs, without the fear of God being worried. God has become the image of a kind-hearted being who fulfills all our desires. When the fear in our hearts is directed towards God and nothing else, only then can we avoid hypocrisy by living a life of faith that acknowledges God in every moment of our lives. Satan causes us to miss the most important aspect in our life of faith when he deceives us. So without realizing that we are missing it, he causes us to falter. We cannot help but feel scared or tremble when we see that the image of God presented by the church is the same as Satan's deception. Even now, God tells us to not be afraid of the world, but to only fear God who desires for us to become believers rather than hypocrites. Revelation 14 verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Chapter 7 Misinterpretation Due to Hypocrisy In the previous chapters, we have seen that the original meaning of hypocrisy is derived from a play featuring a mask that reveals an inside that differs from its appearance on the outside. However, there is a phenomenon that occurs when we live a life that differs inside and out. We tend to worry about the outside more than the inside. It is becoming impossible to understand all the important spiritual words that God has spoken on a spiritual level, whereas we can only understand His concepts and guidance in the carnal sense on a physical level. In other words, the message of God's eternal blessing and grace is interpreted only with the things that can be seen and touched in this world. Concerning hypocrites, Matthew 23 verses 23 to 26 says that by focusing only on outward appearances, they lose the most important spiritual truth. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. What God wants us to achieve by keeping the law is to learn justice, mercy, and faith. However, it is said that because they solely focused on following the outer precepts of the law, they did not receive the grace of God. In particular, God really wanted us to attain His grace through those virtues by keeping to the laws. Moreover, what God wants us to learn from the purifying laws is for us to purify our hearts. Because our heart is focused only on the outward appearance while abiding by the rules, we have not received the grace to purify our hearts through following the purifying laws. Since we tend to understand only God's blessings and grace as things that are visible, touched, and felt, we miss out on the true blessings that can be enjoyed eternally, even though those blessings are invisible and untouchable at this moment. Therefore, we had no choice in the end but to become hypocrites who live more consciously of the world than we do of God. 
Jesus gave this warning that our eyes value only what can be seen and give our hearts only to what is visible. Looking back on our lives, we can see that because we give our hearts only to that which is seen, we could not comprehend the precious truths of the eternal invisible God. As a result, we misunderstood God, misinterpreted His Word, and eventually became people who do not truly love God. Now we do not even know whether we truly love God or not. At the time of Jesus, the Jews were dedicated to continuing their faith while keeping the laws of the Bible with indomitable persistence as they had not regained their political independence from Babylonian exile except during the Maccabean Rebellion, 142-61 BC. After they had lost their country politically and had not retrieved it for a long time, they had a strong desire to follow the laws of the Bible thoroughly in order to win the heart of God and regain their country's independence. So at that time, the Pharisees studied and interpreted the Word of God. They taught the people the laws and made people obey the laws strictly. The Sadducees were primarily composed of priestly nobles who were in charge of high sacramental affairs. The Sadducees and Pharisees were representatives of the Sanhedrin, including courts and councils. The scribes were who copied the Bible. They were known for copying the Bible through strict living standards and devotion. For the Jews, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes were an effort to know and keep God's word well. Through such efforts, they had the purpose of realizing the desire to restore the nation. Then, what were they missing? Desiring to be freed from the curse that had taken their country while assiduously serving God. Trying to win the heart of God while strictly keeping the law. Trying to get out of the difficulties their ancestors experienced when they distanced themselves from God. They did not know what they were missing. However, even we do not know what we are missing. They were missing what God really wants. However, Jesus made it clear what we were all missing. Matthew 9 verse 13 But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Here Jesus speaks of Hosea 6 verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Jesus gave us an accurate diagnosis of what we are missing. Jesus said to learn the meaning of these words, however, it is difficult to understand without understanding God's intentions. How do the words, which say that he doesn't call the righteous but sinners, and that he desires mercy and not sacrifices, are connected? How to determine what constitutes as the mercy and knowledge of God that can please God? Clearly, it is a truth that can be known only by learning. So I meditated on the words that explain what God really wants. Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Since what God requires and desires is for us to not fear the world, but fear God and with all our heart and mind to love God, what he really wants is our sincere heart without the heart of hypocrisy. Psalm 34 verse 18 The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. The hearts that God desires are contrite hearts, repentant hearts, and humble hearts. These hearts are those that desire God's mercy and are drawn near to Him. That is, He desires the heart of a sinner, not the heart of the righteous, and he calls for those who have such hearts. Deuteronomy 10 verse 16 Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart, 
and be stiff-necked no longer. What God wants is not the outside, but what is on the inside. God, who made a covenant by circumcision, wanted the people who made a covenant with him to live only in the eyes of God. He wanted them separated from the world, to fear only God and not the world. In fact, he wants a God-centered heart without hypocrisy separated from the world. Proverb 2400 hours 12 If you say, Surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? It is said that God is the one who weighs our hearts and protects our soul. For the one who weighs our hearts, it is impossible not to distinguish between the outward and inward appearances. Having a difference between the outside and the inside is hypocrisy. It is God who has insight into our hearts, and he will reward them accordingly. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 14 I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing taken from it. God does it, that man should fear before him. Everything God does is eternal, but we keep making worldly connections and thinking only of the physical blessings in a world where our lives are short-lived. God gives us the blessing of eternal life so that we do not live in fear of the world, but in fear of God alone. What God really wants and what Jesus wanted us to realize is through Matthew 9 verse 13, we have been missing a heart that was not different from the outside and from within. We lack a heart that lives in the eyes of God without being deprived of the heart of the world. Our hearts are missing the quality that only fears God free from the fear of the world and hypocrisy. I understand clearly now. Jesus' warning against hypocrisy, which states that hypocrisy will only lead us to interpreting his message of eternal blessings and the grace of God as only being seen and touched in the world, is now very understandable. It is also now understandable that due to hypocrisy, our condition has led us to lose our true inner selves while preserving our superficial appearances. We also fell into the same hypocrisy associated with the authority of the hypocrites, those who will be convicted in the last days. Now, we have to come out from there. We now need to make the decision to repent, turn back to God, and proclaim to live a God-fearing life. Chapter 8 Blind from Hypocrisy Many times, Jesus told the hypocrites that they are blind people who cannot see even when they do see. There is a direct relation between hypocrisy and being blind. It is important to study how the relationship is connected and how it applies to us. Below are the words to the hypocrites and religious leaders whom Jesus said were blind. Matthew 15 verse 14 let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Matthew 23 verse 17 Fools and blind! For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Matthew 23 verse 24 Blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Matthew 23 verse 26 Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Luke 6 verse 39 And he spoke a parable to them, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? Luke 6 verse 42 Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. To the religious leaders and hypocrites, Jesus called them, 
blind leaders of the blind, fools and blind, blind guides, blind Pharisee, and who have plank in their own eyes but do not see. I wanted to know what he meant when he continuously described hypocrites with words related to being blind. When Jesus said they became blind, I wanted to know in detail what they could not see, why they could not see, and why they did not know they could not see. In Matthew 6, Jesus speaks of hypocrites and says, Do not seek to be seen by men, but to be seen by God who sees in secret. And in verse 22, he speaks of the eyes. Matthew 6 verses 21 to 24 For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The preceding verses explain that when the eyes are not blind, it is when we live in the light. When the eyes are blind, it is when we do not live in the light, but rather in the darkness. He then explains that whether my treasure is in heaven or on earth, one can know by looking at where my heart is. Whether God is in control of my heart, or whether things in the world take over my heart, only one of the two has a place in my heart. Since God is light and the world is dark, if something has a place in my heart, it is not a heart that loves God. Rather, it is a heart towards the world. Meaning that I have become blind because I am in darkness and my eyes have become bad. Since hypocrisy is not living in the eyes of God but living consciously in the eyes of the world and fearing the world rather than fearing God, it is true that hypocrisy causes people to go blind because their whole body is in a state of darkness. In Matthew 15 verses 7 to 9 Jesus says, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Then saying, Blind leaders of the blind, because their heart is where the treasure is, their heart is not with God who is light. Therefore, they are blind due to the darkness. Unless we stop fearing the world and only fear God, we cannot escape the sin of hypocrisy. It is hypocrisy that causes us to live in darkness instead of light. The entire chapter of Matthew 23 is addressed to the hypocrites, the religious leaders. At the end of the chapter, there is a message that makes us realize how terrible the sin of hypocrisy really is. Matthew 23 verse 37 O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. No matter how much God tries to give grace because they have become blind, their eyes are dark, they do not understand, and they cannot discern. Instead, the situation turns into their rejection and refusal of His grace. I realize that the sin of hypocrisy is the sin that cannot be forgiven. Through the act of not wanting to receive grace and rejecting His love, it is impossible for them to see and discern correctly regardless of how hard God tries to forgive them. It is really terrifying. I could not live in the eyes of God, but I was conscious of the eyes of men. I lived my life hoping to be recognized by people and to be exalted by people. 
The object of my fear was not God, who would give eternal punishment, but the world. My heart on the outside was different than the inside. I lived in the sin of hypocrisy, of which the Lord warned us so much, but since I was blinded by the sin of hypocrisy, I, no one else, am a sinner who needs to beat my chest and repent and return to God. I didn't realize it. I was blind, and I was a hypocrite. Comforting words were still said to such blind people. These are the words spoken to the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Revelation 3 verses 15 to 19 I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with thy salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. I think the depiction of the Laodicean church is similar to churches in society today. However, they are described as blind and naked. Their minds which have need of nothing explain that they are truly blind people who cannot see, despite being in the darkness due to their hypocrisy. Nevertheless, the Word of God, which He loved and cried out to enlighten them and said, Be zealous and repent. Even for those of us who are blind now, he says. Be zealous and repent. He still gives us a chance, he still wants to forgive us, and he waits for us to return with a contrite heart and live a life that only fears God. If we don't, then as the Bible says, But you are not willing. We are rejecting grace because of our blindness, which will result in being unforgivable. It is as Jesus warned of the sin of hypocrisy. Chapter 9 The Sin of Wealthy Heart Through the content of the previous chapters, we established the biblical concept of the Antichrist and underlined text regarding the authority that has continued to oppose Jesus Christ and his saints. We also discussed that the authority that is against Jesus Christ is the authority of hypocrites who lead people into their influence through hypocrisy. We then looked at the biblical concept of hypocrisy. We learned that hypocrisy is not living in the sight of God, but living consciously from human eyes. These are the eyes in which we do not seek approval from God, but rather from people. We live in fear of the world, not in fear of God. Hypocrisy also makes us lose any valuable qualities and characteristics on the inside by only appreciating the outside aspects. As a result, we eventually lose the light, live in the dark, and become blind. So it was said that no matter how much God tries to pour out His grace, we would reject His grace and not receive forgiveness, eventually being left destroyed. The reason for learning about hypocrisy was because Jesus expressed the power of the Antichrist, the power that opposes Jesus as hypocrites, and explained all their sins as hypocrisy. So to find out what makes them oppose Jesus, we wanted to have a clear understanding of hypocrisy. The more we know about hypocrisy, however, the more we feel that we cannot point fingers at others because the sin of hypocrisy is simply a sin of our own nature. We wanted to learn about hypocrisy to understand the sin of the power of the Antichrist, but as we begin to see each moment we live in the sin of hypocrisy, we feel how sinful we really are. 
It is not necessarily a sin to deliberately have bad intentions and plan to harm other people. It is the natural desire of the heart, a desire to be admired and recognized by people, that every human being has. However, such a heart creates a heart that acts differently on the inside and outside. Such a heart creates a heart that does not fear God and seeks only the glory of men. Also, such a heart creates a heart that built the Tower of Babel. We are sinners, so everything that comes out of us is evil. I became curious. Eventually, if someone sits in a place where people look up, everyone can become a hypocrite, but Jesus only said to the religious leaders, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, snakes, and brood of vipers. Jesus was a friend of the lowly, the poor, and sinners in a very different way than how he dealt with people other than religious leaders to the extent that people called Jesus. A friend of tax collectors and sinners, Matthew 11 verse 19. If they ascend to a higher position, poor and lowly people in society today would not be different from the hypocrites, Pharisees and Sadducees. Then, by sitting in a place of authority where everyone can become hypocritical, hearing Jesus say that those very people are snakes and a brood of vipers, may lead us to think that it is a loss for those to be condemned and are in high positions. However, in light of the word, it is true that they are at a loss. Since Jesus said, Blessed are the poor. It is true that the poor are more blessed than the high and the rich at a loss. Luke 6 verse 20, Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples, and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Matthew 11 verse 5, The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Psalm 138 verse 6, Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. James 2 verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Luke 4 verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Matthew 19 verse 24 And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. If it is a loss to sit in a high position, be wealthy, and be admired by people, that if it is unfortunate rather than being blessed, we may think that God is not just. However, the Bible explains how God's calculations are accurate. Matthew 6 verse 2 Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew 6 verse 16 Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew 6 verse 5 And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. If we compare and calculate according to what we receive in this world and enjoy, we cannot help but say that God's calculation is just and accurate. As we learn the calculations made by God who gives us eternal life, our understanding of blessing changes greatly.
We are accustomed to the concept of blessing from a myopic point of view, where we only see this fleeting world that passes so quickly, but clearly, the concept of God's blessing is boundless, encompassing both this world and the eternal world. Then we can't help but ask the question, does it mean that everyone in this world must become poor and lowly in order to be blessed? However, in the previous chapters, we dealt with the content that God allows us to achieve internal and spiritual things through superficial and external things. In Matthew 23 verse 24, Jesus said to the Pharisees who relied only on formalities and missed the true spiritual truths. Blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. He expressed the inner and spiritual aspects as a camel, and the external aspects as a gnat. So the blessings we receive from being poor in this world are the size of a gnat, and the blessings we receive from being poor in spirit are the size of a camel. Therefore, Jesus said, The poor have the gospel preached to them, and to the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The gospel was preached to the poor, but it does not say whether they attained the kingdom of heaven. However, for those who are poor in spirit, it is proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. If poor circumstances make my heart poor before God, making me dependent on God rather than myself, then a blessing the size of a gnat becomes a blessing the size of a camel for me. Conversely, when I am in a position where I am exalted and looked up to, and if my heart is exalted while enjoying the recognition of others from my heart, I become a hypocrite. My blessing then becomes cursed as the size of a camel through misfortune as small as a gnat. Ultimately, what God wants is not a proud heart, but a heart that is humble and poor, trusting only in God and submitting to God. We examined hypocrisy to understand the power of hypocrisy, the power that opposes Jesus, and the power of the Antichrist, but we realized that the sin of hypocrisy was not the sin of them, but the sin of us, and that the sin of hypocrisy was a sin of the exalted hearts and wealthy hearts. We came to know how much more confidently and accurately the concept of blessing was preached in the Word, rather than the concept of the blessing we think of. Now, it is necessary to look back at us to see if we are living a life that will eventually lead to punishment by missing out on the true blessing because of our flawed concept of blessing. I was delighted to be able to ascend to a higher position. I was delighted to make more money. I was delighted to make more profits. I was delighted to have enjoyed more benefits. I was delighted to see my influence grow and more people follow me. I rejoiced in believing that all of these were blessings from God. As I rejoiced and enjoyed it, my heart became as high as the blessings I enjoyed. There is no remorseful or desperate heart that desires to get close to God in order to be dependent on Him and ask for God's grace. Luke 6 verse 25 Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Due to our hypocrisy, if we do not repent now and turn to God with all our heart, we will eventually not hear or see the Lord who constantly asks us to repent. Now is the time to return with a repentant heart to the Lord who tells us that having a poor heart is the greatest blessing. Chapter 10 The Portion with the Hypocrites In the last chapter, we shared that hypocrisy is the sin of having a wealthy heart rather than a poor heart. Since having a poor heart is the greatest blessing, we can possess the kingdom of heaven when our hearts are poor. 
Having an exalted and wealthy heart means that we cannot attain eternal life. So Jesus constantly warned us that trying to be in a high position can make us have a proud heart and an exalted heart. Matthew 23 verses 6 to 8 They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you, do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Luke 14 verses 7 to 11 So he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When Jesus cursed the hypocrites and said, Woe to you, he was not only speaking to some of the proud Pharisees and Sadducees, but to all the religious leaders. No matter what group we find ourselves in, there are bad people and good people. Similarly, there are people who have faith and people who do not have it, and it is not easy to think that they sin the same way. But Jesus declared to all the people of the religious leaders that they were hypocrites. Being in a high position with the exaltation of people is a strong temptation that leads to having proud hearts. These proud hearts fall down to the extent that the whole group would commit the same type of sin and all fall. I then began to think about the current Christian leaders, specifically, the leaders who are given prestigious recognition and respect that provides them with the influence to lead others who praise them with exaltation and adoration while enjoying the magnitude of their influence. Particularly the admiration and adoration for Pastor Billy Graham, whose words could influence most people, was greater than any other pastor. When people are placed in positions so high, human hearts could not help but be exalted together. Jesus defined the religious leaders as a group of hypocrites, however, we place today's Christian religious leaders in places of such high authority that we fail to recognize the danger of perishing from the sin of hypocrisy. Not solely limited to the religious leaders with great influence over people, the temptation to hypocrisy spread among us as leaven, which Jesus described as the leaven of the Pharisees. When we began to believe in Jesus, we repented with tears, we had contrite hearts, and we decided to obey the Lord with a poor and humble heart. Due to the growth of our knowledge of the Bible and people becoming leaders and teachers over time, there is now a lack of a contrite and poor heart. As much as we exert influence, the heart has exalted. A pastor who once served with a poor heart and shepherded every soul with a heart desired for people to hear the gospel of the Lord and become followers. As the number of church members increased, the heart that once regarded every soul with a precious heart has now been relaxed and loosened, thus, the zeal for the lost souls has disappeared. But the larger problem is that the leaven of the Pharisees, which Jesus told us to be very careful of, has spread so much throughout Christianity. We have come to a point where we think it is natural for our minds to be exalted over time. When we understand why Jesus told us to be so careful about hypocrisy, we can no longer have that complacency. Matthew 24 verses 1 to 3 then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, 
not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? The entire chapter of Matthew 24 consists of Jesus' answer to the disciples' question related to the temple's destruction and the sign of Jesus' return at the end of the world. Matthew 24 is the scripture that explains the events of the last days and what will happen when Jesus returns. The following are the last verses of Matthew 24. Matthew 24 verses 44 to 51 Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The last two verses describe those who will be punished when Jesus returns, saying that he will appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. It is the punishment that the Antichrist will receive. It is the punishment that God's enemies will receive. It is the punishment that the object of God's vengeance will receive. Those who are not faithful will share the punishment with them, the hypocrites. For those of us who think that hypocrisy is not a serious crime, it is important to remember that God showed us how to check who the hypocrites are, how they will be judged upon Jesus' return, and that everyone with the same sin will share a portion of the judgment with the hypocrites. As a result, we cannot help but be watchful and alert to hypocrisy. Because Jesus cursed the religious leaders and said, brood of vipers and snakes, it is hard to realize that we can be punished with them for the same sin. Although I personally live in fear of the world and enjoy being exalted and recognized by the people, I cannot associate myself with those whom Jesus called brood of vipers and snakes. I cannot even imagine that I will share their sin. However, there is the word that reminds us how we are thinking incorrectly. Mark 8 verse 33 But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan! For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. This is the context of Jesus saying to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Stating that Satan's work is to think of the things of man and not of God. We have to realize that we are very, very wrong in many ways. What we have to do now is open our eyes through repentance, see our problems correctly, and return to God. Through the previous chapters, we have discussed that the authority of hypocrites is the power that opposes Jesus and his beloved followers until he comes again to judge them. The authority of hypocrites who oppose Jesus is the power of the Antichrist. We also discussed hypocrisy, which is a tool used by the authority of hypocrites to bring people into their power. When we become hypocrites, we fall under the authority of the hypocrites. For that reason, God cried out to us to come out of her. In order to get out of her, we studied about the hypocrisy that Jesus warned us about. In this chapter, we will take a closer look at Rome, now at the center of the authority of the hypocrites and of which was warned to us through the Bible and the writings of our ancestors of faith. 
I want to create an opportunity to objectively analyze the content they proclaim and compare it throughout the Word, discerning them with confidence in the Word and realizing how important it is to make a decision to get out of their influence. So that we can accurately understand their characteristics, the first thing we want to approach is comparing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which Jesus continues to talk about in the Gospels, and the Roman Church, which is the authority of the hypocrites today. As for the words with which Jesus warned against hypocrites, I thought it would be important to analyze how the current power of hypocrites would be compared. This is because when we see how it relates to the present authority in the light of Jesus' warnings, we can determine exactly whether the authority is really against Jesus or not. For this comparison, I needed official data that could contrast the Bible with current society. The materials I read were the dogmatic constitutions promulgated by the First and Second Vatican Councils. When the Papal State fell around 1870, Roman Catholicism began to take an entirely different form in its relationship to the world. In the past, its form was coercive in an attempt to make everyone a member of the Church of Rome, but after the fall of the Papal State, efforts were made to peacefully unite with all religions. An expression of such an effort appears through the First and Second Vatican Councils, 8. The First Vatican Council was from 1869 to 1870 and the Second Vatican Council was from 1962 to 1965, with the Second Vatican Council as the recent council in history. 9. As we examine the dogmatic constitutions of the First and Second Vatican Councils, which proclaimed the official content decided and approved through these councils, we will discern their doctrines in the light of the Word. Regarding the dogmatic constitutions of the First Vatican Council, I first wanted to examine all the contents together as the content was entirely contrary to the words of the Bible. The document is divided into four chapters, but due to the length of the content, it was not possible to insert the entire document. Instead, the abridged content of each chapter is included in the following pages. Chapter 1, On the Institution of the Apostolic Primacy in Blessed Peter. 1. We teach and declare that, according to the Gospel evidence, a primacy of jurisdiction over the whole Church of God was immediately and directly promised to the blessed Apostle Peter and conferred on him by Christ the Lord. 2. It was to Simon alone, to whom he had already said, You shall be called Cephas, that the Lord, after his confession, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, spoke these words, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the underworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be lost in heaven. Chapter 2 On the Permanence of the Primacy of Blessed Peter in the Roman Pontiffs 1. That which our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Shepherds and Great Shepherd of the Sheep, established in the Blessed Apostle Peter for the continual salvation and permanent benefit of the Church, must of necessity remain forever, by Christ's authority, in the Church which, founded as it is upon a rock, will stand firm until the end of time. 2. For no one can be in doubt, indeed it was known in every age that the holy and most blessed Peter, Prince, and Head of the Apostles, the pillar of faith and the foundation of the Catholic Church received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to this day and forever he lives and presides and exercises judgment in his successors the bishops of the Holy Roman See which he founded and consecrated with his blood. Chapter 3 On the Power and Character of the Primacy of the Roman Pontiff 1. And so, 
supported by the clear witness of Holy Scripture, and adhering to the manifest and explicit decrees both of our predecessors, the Roman Pontiffs, and of General Councils, we promulgate anew the definition of the Ecumenical Council of Florence, which must be believed by all faithful Christians, namely that the Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold a worldwide primacy, and that the Roman Pontiff is the successor of Blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, true Vicar of Christ, Head of the whole Church and Father and Teacher of all Christian people. To him, in Blessed Peter, full power has been given by our Lord Jesus Christ to tend, rule, and govern the universal Church. All this is to be found in the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils and the Sacred Canons. 2. Wherefore we teach and declare that, by divine ordinance, the Roman Church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power over every other Church, and that this jurisdictional power of the Roman Pontiff is both episcopal and immediate. Both clergy and faithful, of whatever right and dignity, both singly and collectively, are bound to submit to this power by the duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience, and this not only in matters concerning faith and morals, but also in those which regard the discipline and government of the Church throughout the world. 3. In this way, by unity with the Roman Pontiff in communion and in profession of the same faith, the Church of Christ becomes one flock under one supreme shepherd. Chapter 4 On the Infallible Teaching Authority of the Roman Pontiff 2. So the Fathers of the Fourth Council of Constantinople following the footsteps of their predecessors, publish this solemn profession of faith. The first condition of salvation is to maintain the rule of the true faith. And since that saying of our Lord Jesus Christ, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, cannot fail of its effect, the words spoken are confirmed by their consequences. For in the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been preserved unblemished, and sacred doctrine been held in honor. Since it is our earnest desire to be in no way separated from this faith and doctrine, we hope that we may deserve to remain in that one communion which the apostolic see preaches, for in it is the whole and true strength of the Christian religion. What is more, with the approval of the Second Council of Lyons, the Greeks made the following profession. The Holy Roman Church possesses the supreme and full primacy and principality over the whole Catholic Church. She truly and humbly acknowledges that she received this from the Lord Himself and blessed Peter, the Prince and Chief of the Apostles, whose successor the Roman Pontiff is, together with the fullness of power. And since before all others she has the duty of defending the truth of the faith, so if any questions arise concerning the faith, it is by her judgment that they must be settled. Then there is the definition of the Council of Florence. The Roman Pontiff is the true Vicar of Christ, the head of the whole Church and the Father and Teacher of all Christians, and to him was committed in blessed Peter, by our Lord Jesus Christ, the full power of tending, ruling and governing the whole Church. 6. For the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter not so that they might, by his revelation, make known some new doctrine, but that, by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. Indeed, their apostolic teaching was embraced by all the venerable fathers and reverenced and followed by all the holy orthodox doctors, for they knew very well that this see of St. Peter always remains unblemished by any error, in accordance with the divine promise of our Lord and Savior to the Prince of his disciples, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. 7. This gift of truth and never-failing faith was therefore divinely conferred on Peter and his successors in this sea so that they might discharge their exalted office for the salvation of all, and so that the whole flock of Christ might be kept away by them from the poisonous food of error and be nourished with the sustenance of heavenly doctrine. Thus the tendency to schism is removed and the whole church is preserved in unity, 
and, resting on its foundation, can stand firm against the gates of hell. 8. But since in this very age, when the salutary effectiveness of the apostolic office is most especially needed, not a few are to be found who disparage its authority, we judge it absolutely necessary to affirm solemnly the prerogative which the only begotten Son of God was pleased to attach to the supreme pastoral office. 9. Therefore, faithfully adhering to the tradition received from the beginning of the Christian faith, to the glory of God our Savior, for the exaltation of the Catholic religion and for the salvation of the Christian people, with the approval of the Sacred Council, we teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that, when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is, when, one, in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, two, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, three, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. He possesses, by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, that infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves, and not by the consent of the church, irreformable. So then, should anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity. As I read the dogmatic constitution of the First Vatican Council, Jesus urged for us to be careful hinted towards uncovering hypocrisy. I decided to compare the content of the dogmatic constitution above to our examination of the warnings of hypocrisy among Jesus' words. Matthew 23 is entirely written as a warning against hypocrisy and proclaims a curse on the religious leaders, as Jesus continues to cry out, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! As a result, I decided to look at the first part of Matthew 23, verses 1 to 12. Matthew 23, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, whatever they tell you, do and comply with it all, but do not do as they do, for they say things and do not do them. And they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as their finger. And they do all their deeds to be noticed by other people, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. And they love the place of honor at banquets, and the seats of honor in the synagogues, and personal greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by the people. But as for you, do not be called rabbi, for only one is your teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for only one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, for only one is your leader, that is, Christ. But the greatest of you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. The dogmatic constitution mentioned in several instances stating, the Roman pontiff hold a worldwide primacy, and that the Roman pontiff is the successor of blessed Peter, the prince of the apostles, true vicar of Christ, head of the whole church and father and teacher of all Christian people. The Bible says, One is your teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. But the Church of Rome tells us that the Roman pontiff is the teacher of all Christian people. The Bible says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for only one is your father, he who is in heaven. But the Church of Rome tells us that the Roman pontiff is the father of all Christian people. The Bible says, Do not be called leaders, for only one is your leader, that is, Christ. But the Church of Rome tells us that the Roman pontiff holds the worldwide primacy. The Bible says, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, 
and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But the Church of Rome tells us to exalt the leaders of the Church of Rome. The Bible's statements about the Antichrist in the original Greek language is Antichristos. Anti means against, instead of, and Christos is Christ. Together, Antichrist means one who opposes Christ, one who represents Christ, or the Vicar of Christ. But the Roman Church tells us to call the Roman Pontiff the True Vicar of Christ. Looking at the content of the dogmatic constitution above, we can see that Jesus' preaching and interjections about forbidding hypocrisy were in fact required by the Church of Rome to do the very opposite. I couldn't help but be surprised at how the Roman Church demanded people to do everything that Jesus had warned to be on guard of and forbidden people from hypocrisy. In Matthew 15 verses 6 to 9 Jesus explained the cause of hypocrisy. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. To those who forsake the commandments of God in order to keep the traditions of men, Jesus said that they are hypocrites. Furthermore, as Isaiah stated, they are those who do not honor God with their hearts, but honor God with their lips. However, when we continue to read the dogmatic constitutions, it is stated that the infallibility of the Roman pontiff was asserted, saying, faithfully adhering to the tradition received from the beginning of the Christian faith. This assertion of the infallibility of the Roman pontiff is declared to be the way to maintain tradition. In a similar vein, what Jesus said to Pharisees, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, applies exactly here to the Church of Rome. Furthermore, there are verses in the Bible that completely invalidate all their claims. Galatians 2 verses 11 to 14 Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? The verses above describe Peter who was eating a meal with Gentiles. Upon the arrival of the circumcised Jews, Peter's fear in showing them that he was eating a meal with Gentiles led to his withdrawal from them. His actions led the remaining Jews and even Barnabas to withdraw as well. Peter's hypocrisy allowed the hypocrite's leaven to affect Barnabas and other Jews around him. Due to Peter's act of hypocrisy, Paul called out Peter for the blame of his hypocritical actions. The dogmatic constitution states, This see of St. Peter always remains unblemished by any error in accordance with the divine promise of our Lord and Savior to the prince of his disciples. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. They are claiming the infallibility of the Roman pontiffs because they are successors of Peter and his protection from the Lord to not fail. However, the Bible says that Peter was publicly rebuked by Paul for the sin of hypocrisy. It was not at that time before he received the Holy Spirit, but it was while he was ministering. It can be seen that the system of the Roman Church built with the belief that there could be no fault in Peter and his successors, was based on a very wrong idea.
I cannot help but be appalled to learn how even Peter, who was the apostle of Jesus, could fall into the sin of hypocrisy through his fear of the people around him instead of God. I also learned how unbiblical beliefs can still deceive people when hypocrisy is used to control people's hearts. By comparing the dogmatic constitution of the Church of Rome with the Word of God, it became very clear that the teachings of the Roman Church are not biblical. Rather, they teach people to become hypocrites. The content further underlined that they are the authority of hypocrites mentioned by Jesus in this time. Chapter 12 The Second Vatican Council In the last chapter, we analyzed the content of the dogmatic constitution proclaimed at the First Vatican Council and compared it to biblical verses on the subject of hypocrisy that Jesus told us to be careful of. This chapter, we will analyze the dogmatic constitutions promulgated by the Second Vatican Council. Among the contents, there were many instances which reaffirmed previous proclamations in the First Vatican Council, so those contents have not been inserted. Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation Therefore both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerated with the same sense of loyalty and reverence. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the Word of God committed to the Church. It is clear, therefore, that sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the teaching authority of the Church, in accord with God's most wise design, are so linked and joined together that one cannot stand without the others, and that all together and each in its own way under the action of the one Holy Spirit contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. In the contents of the Second Vatican Council, we can see that the authority toward their traditions is raised to the same level as the Bible while forcing obedience to such authority. We can see how the Church of Rome strives to raise the authority of their traditions and teachings to the same level as the Bible so that those who believe in the Bible will recognize their authority as the same level. In the last days, it is said that all but those who have the seal of God belong to the side of destruction. The appearance of establishing the highest form of authority that is recognizable by people is something we should pay attention to. Dogmatic Constitution on the Church This Church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him, although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. These elements, as gifts belonging to the Church of Christ, are forces impelling toward Catholic unity. Those who approach the sacrament of penance obtain pardon from the mercy of God for the offense committed against him and are at the same time reconciled with the church, which they have wounded by their sins, and which by charity, example, and prayer seeks their conversion. Basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition, it teaches that the church, now sojourning on earth as an exile, is necessary for salvation. Christ present to us in his body, which is the Church, is the one mediator and the unique way of salvation. In explicit terms he himself affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism and thereby affirmed also the necessity of the Church, for through baptism as through a door men enter the Church. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. In all of Christ's disciples, the Spirit arouses the desire to be peacefully united in the manner determined by Christ as one flock under one shepherd, and he prompts them to pursue this end. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. In the first place amongst these, there are the Muslims, who, professing to hold the faith of Abraham, along with us adore the one and merciful God, who on the last day will judge mankind. 
nor is God far distant from those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God, for it is he who gives to all men life and breath and all things, and as Savior wills that all men be saved. Vicar of Christ and pastor of the whole church, the Roman pontiff has full, supreme and universal power over the church. A council is never ecumenical unless it is confirmed or at least accepted as such by the successor of Peter, and it is prerogative of the Roman pontiff to convoke these councils, to preside over them and to confirm them. This states that the Catholic Church can proclaim the forgiveness of sins, that the Catholic Church is the only church in the world, and that the Catholic Church is the only mediator and only way for salvation. Also, it states that God has given the highest authority in the world to the Church of Rome. Here, the Roman Church is placing themselves on the highest place above everything else in the world. On the other hand, we can also see their efforts to accept and embrace all people of all other religions. The work of those who oppose God in the end time and the efforts to bring as many people as possible into their influence can be clearly seen in the content of the dogmatic constitutions of the Church of Rome. Decree on Ecumenism The restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. However, many Christian communions present themselves to men as the true inheritors of Jesus Christ. All indeed profess to be followers of the Lord, but differ in mind and go their different ways, as if Christ himself were divided. Such division openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages the holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature. But the Lord of ages wisely and patiently follows out the plan of grace on our behalf, sinners that we are. In recent times more than ever before, he has been rousing divided Christians to remorse over their divisions and to a longing for unity. Everywhere large numbers have felt the impulse of this grace, and among our separated brethren also there increased from day to day the movement, fostered by the grace of the Holy Spirit, for the restoration of unity among all Christians. This movement toward unity is called ecumenical. Nevertheless, our separated brethren, whether considered as individuals or as communities and churches, are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on all those who through him were born again into one body, and with him quickened to newness of life, that unity which the holy scriptures and the ancient tradition of the church proclaim. For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church, which is the all-embracing means of salvation, that they can benefit fully from the means of salvation. We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant to the apostolic college alone, of which Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. A fact we can draw from the content of the dogmatic constitution of the Second Vatican Council historically executed Protestant Christians labeled heretics. Here, they now call Protestant Christians separated brethren asking to be united. However, the Second Vatican Council delineates that unification must happen within the Church of Rome stating, For it is only through Christ's Catholic Church. Additionally, they continued to emphasize for unification and proclaim that it is the will of God to do so. It is said that the history of ancestors who risked their lives to belong to the light. Furthermore, the history of choosing the light after being separated from the darkness is proclaimed as something that requires repentance because they have separated from the authority of the Church of Rome. They also state that God is the one who asks for the ecumenical movement, meaning that it is God who wants us to unite with the Church of Rome and repent for the great works of our ancestors of faith. They only make claims that are very much contrary to God's will and His Word. 
Yet, if there is anyone who wants to become one with the Church of Rome and unite with them through ecumenical movement, it can only be said that this person does not see the light of being blind caused by hypocrisy. The Relation of the Church to Non-Christian Religions The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. The Church, therefore, exhorts her sons that through dialogue and collaboration with the followers of other religions, carried out with prudence and love and in witness to the Christian faith and life, they recognize, preserve and promote the good things, spiritual and moral, as well as the socio-cultural values found among these men. We can see here that the Church of Rome strives to embrace even non-Christian religions. Once considered enemies of the Catholic Church, non-Christian religions are being asked to unite. The previous book often discussed the Church of Rome and their desire to unite all the people of the world into one through their power. In the last days, those who do not belong to this power will be the only ones sealed by God. Examining the dogmatic constitutions of the Second Vatican Council above, we can determine that their teachings are in accordance with Jesus' prophecies about the authority of hypocrites. It was also reaffirmed that the truth of God's word, that all men will belong to the authority who oppose God in the last days except those who have been sealed by God. It was a great opportunity to realize once again how important it is for us to stay awake in discernment and belong to God, especially during this time when the fulfillment of all the words of the Bible becomes so clear to us. Chapter 13 The Church of Rome and Christianity By examining the dogmatic constitutions of the First and Second Vatican Councils from the two preceding chapters, respectively, it was possible to clearly confirm the Church of Rome's pursuits and goals. When the definition of hypocrisy was unclear to me, I thought that the actions and doctrines of the Catholic Church that emphasized the external aspects were inappropriate. However, I did not recognize the extent to how much they were opposed to God and His will. Seeing the Church of Rome placing great emphasis on outward appearances, especially since the growth of human gatherings tends to become legalistic and rely heavily on appearances, did not seem like such a major problem knowing they had held just strong power for so long. As the definition of the sin of hypocrisy was established and solidified, it became very clear how every proclamation of the Church of Rome is against God, how their teachings despise God, and how hypocritical the Church of Rome is. We could also see that the hypocritical pattern of the scribes and Pharisees not only continued but also continued to worsen, as Jesus had foretold. When Jesus was talking about the evil generation, the hypocrites, he said in Matthew 12, The last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. I was able to confirm that everything regarding the authority of the hypocrites in Jesus' proclamation through the Bible juxtaposed to the Roman Church's proclamations revealed that there was no aspect of the dogmatic proclamations which coincided with God's words. Now, our understanding of God's word and his true meaning of Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues has become clearer. Through the content of the dogmatic constitutions, we could clearly understand the ecumenical movement. It states, A council is never ecumenical unless it is confirmed or at least accepted as such by the successor of Peter, and it is prerogative of the Roman pontiff to convoke these councils, to preside over them and to confirm them. 
meaning that the ecumenical movements of which the Christian churches are members belong to the acceptance and confirmation of the Roman pontiff. They also explained that the ecumenical movement is the movement for repentance of separation from the Church of Rome. This means that the history of the Reformation, in which Christianity was separated from darkness to light, is defined by the Church of Rome as a sin that requires repentance. Many of the churches with liberal faith in Christianity belong to the World Christian Council, WCC, or organizations that cooperate with the WCC. WCC was discussed in detail in the previous book and is an organization that implements ecumenical movement. Since the majority of the churches are member churches of the WCC, and there are many churches affiliated with organizations that cooperate with the WCC, it can only be said that the influence that the Roman Church has on Christian churches is enormous. We might think that liberal Christian churches continue the pro-Catholic relationship with the Church of Rome. However, there are many facts that state this is not the case. The National Association of Evangelicals, NAE, is the organization to which the majority of conservative rather than liberal Christian churches in the United States belong. It is an evangelical organization representing conservative churches with most conservative denominations and conservative churches belonging to this group. By looking at their relationship with the Roman Church, however, it can be seen that maintaining a good relationship with the Roman Church is not limited to liberal Christianity. The founding of the National Association of Evangelicals, NAE, 1942, and the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 1965, the signs of warming since the founding of the NAE and the decisions of Vatican II. The restoration of relations with conservative evangelical groups began with the Second Vatican Council, discussed in the last chapter. A representative figure of the evangelical organization, NAE, is Billy Graham. Drawing back to what was discussed throughout the previous book, Billy Graham is famous for continuing to be very pro-Catholic in his relationship with the Church of Rome. Furthermore, the most representative and recognized theological university for evangelicals in the NAE is a member of the Boston Theological Institute, which is an association of nine theological universities which form a consortium. All the other members belong to the Church of Rome or WCC. These explanations are not intended to take issue with a particular group but to explain the current situation that most Protestant churches continue to maintain pro-Catholic ties to the Roman Church regardless of liberal or conservative tendencies. The content of the dogmatic constitutions from the preceding chapter state, We believe that our Lord entrusted all the blessings of the New Covenant to the Apostolic College alone, of which Peter is the head, in order to establish the one body of Christ on earth to which all should be fully incorporated who belong in any way to the people of God. It explains that whatever form the Union takes will ultimately fall under the sovereignty of the Roman Church. It further states, The Catholic religion has always been preserved unblemished and always remains unblemished by any error in accordance with the divine promise of our Lord. Since they always claim to be unblemished without any error, this means that the history of the Reformation can be explained as an unblemished act on the part of the Church of Rome. So we can understand that they have not changed anything since the time of the Reformation. The discussions regarding the explanations of organizations which oppose God in both the previous book and this book are not intended to oppose them. It is God who will ultimately judge and punish the authority of hypocrites. Nevertheless, the reason we need to be well aware of the authority that displeases God is so that we recognize how their influence affects us. Through this understanding, 
we can completely come out of them in all aspects of our lives. To obey the word of God, which cries out, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. We must be well aware of where we are to come from and how we are affected by them. Now that we know how much we are affected by the influence of the Church of Rome, it is necessary to think about how we can get out of her and turn to God. Chapter 14 The God Situation The previous chapters have allowed us to realize how ignorant we truly are. We did not know what to find darkness and light. Although we were hypocrites living in fear of the world and not of God, we believed that we fervently believed in God. Our ideas about God and ourselves are so wrong that we feel the necessity to have the correct biblical knowledge in all areas of our faith. In this way, I decided to re-examine the history of God's salvation, focusing only on the Bible. God is an omnipotent and almighty God who has the power to do all things. Due to the fact that God is omnipotent, however, there are people who hold many lingering thoughts. If God can do anything and is a loving God, why not forgive everyone, bless them, and send everyone to heaven? What does it mean that God has a son? What is God born of the Virgin? What does it mean to have blood to be forgiven? The idea is that we do not understand how an omnipotent God, one who can do anything and everything, allows us to doubt Him. However, we do not know that there are so many things that God cannot do. Although God is omnipotent and has the power to do all things, He cannot do anything that is contrary to what He has proclaimed. It is easy to misunderstand when we do not know the other person's circumstances, since we do not know God's circumstances very well, we have many misunderstandings about God. In Matthew 22 verse 29, Jesus said, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. It tells us that there are situations where we are mistaken by not knowing God and His situation well. Despite His situation where it was unrealizable to give us grace, He paved new ways to pour grace onto us that previously did not exist while fulfilling all the words He had proclaimed. So when we understand the works of grace that God has poured out upon us, we cannot help but feel moved by the immense love of God. We need to first understand our situation. In Genesis 2 verse 7, God commanded, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. However, Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and humans are now confined under the curse of God who said, You shall surely die. So what God did for us who are confined under the curse is God's project of salvation accomplished throughout human history. It is such a grand project that, without violating any of God's word that He had proclaimed, lawfully frees us from the curse of death ultimately allowing us to have fellowship with God forever. The tool that God used to carry out the project of salvation is the covenant. He made promises through successive covenants, paving ways while fulfilling those promises so that the faith relationship could continue. Eventually, He fulfilled all the covenants and completely accomplished the work of opening the way from the unbreakable curse to the blessing of eternal life. When we see God carrying out and fulfilling the project of salvation shown throughout the Old Testament, we can see God's absolute characteristics expressed by His faithfulness and love. People respond in two ways regarding His absolute qualities. Those who know God's situations and fear Him are touched and grateful to Him for working to give us eternal life, despite having to go through such hardships, 
and then dedicate themselves to loving God with such absolute characteristics. But those who do not know God's situations and do not fear Him, feel an alienation rather than the love of God in the Old Testament. They have come to believe that there are many parts of God that are difficult to understand from the perception of this modern time. Therefore, it is very important to know God's situations and understand the things in the Bible from God's perspective. When we say we believe in Jesus Christ, it is to believe in God who ultimately fulfilled the covenant by sending Jesus. That is why John 12 verse 44 says, then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. However, we misunderstand God and fail to know him, whom we must love and thank with all our heart, mind, body, and soul. John 17 verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Hosea 6 verse 3 says, Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. The Bible speaks of the importance of knowing God. We should become those who can fully come out in a light that pleases God by knowing God, His heart, and His situations. Chapter 15 The First Covenant the previous chapter discussed that the path to victory against Satan's attacks is to know God, know the circumstances and love of God, and receive and enjoy God's gifts which have been given to us through His project of salvation. It is our revival, and we must obey God's command, Come out of her, my people. We then discussed God's project for salvation, which He planned and carried out. This chapter outlines the first covenant that begins God's salvation project. In Genesis 6 verses 5 to 7, there is an explanation of the circumstances prior to the beginning of the covenant. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Our hearts that are always self-centered. Our hearts that seek to be exalted above others and rejoice in being exalted. Our hearts that quickly forget and grumble, no matter how much grace we receive. Even when we look at our hearts, we cannot help but recognize our evil heart where nothing good exists. I thought it is very comprehensive that God, who is completely good and has no darkness, grieved in his heart and lamented that he created man while dealing with our sinful nature. God saw man who disobeyed his word and fell into sin and the dark and sinful nature that comes from every human being. Not only did he see man's external actions, but also that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He even thought of destroying the people from the face of the earth. I think it's very understandable to see how he thinks. If he had destroyed all creation at that time, he would have been free from the lamentations that continued for thousands of years. Because of Noah, the only person in the whole world who feared God at that time, God changed his mind. Genesis 9 verses 8 to 17 Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, 
Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. For us, it is difficult to understand the importance of God's covenant with Noah because God has always kept the covenant and never destroyed the whole world by a flood since then. However, this is the grace of God that allowed humanity to persist while knowing that destruction would not change their sinful nature. After Noah's flood, God could consider destroying all of his creation from the earth at any time and people would worry about global destruction every time it rains. Following the flood, however, God enters into the first covenant with mankind. The significance of entering into a covenant is a firm declaration of God's will with the project of salvation. God very clearly deemed it. The Everlasting Covenant By entering into the covenant, God is bound by a promise to be kept forever. God's everlasting promise with mankind is an expression of His will to establish a relationship that will connect us to Him and forever continue that relationship. As humans, we were not qualified to make an eternal promise due to the curse of, you shall surely die but God's willingness to make such an everlasting covenant with us declares his project of salvation without giving up on humanity. Through the eternal covenant, people could begin a relationship with God in this way. The first covenant marks the beginning of his eternal promise, but at this point, he has not revealed details of how his project of salvation will continue. However, Drawing upon the covenants which continue his accomplishments throughout history, God allows us to confidently declare that he is truly a great and merciful God. Chapter 16 The Covenant with Abraham More than 400 years have passed since Noah's flood. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Even though God searched all over the world for over 400 years looking for those who are loyal to him with all their heart, he could not find one until he found Abraham. The reason humans could not be destroyed is due to God's everlasting covenant with mankind. Nevertheless, God continued to faithfully keep that covenant. God then formed a covenant with Abraham about 450 years after Noah. Genesis 17 verses 1 to 16 contains the content of the covenant with Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, 
all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and also give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of peoples shall be from her. There are parts where God revealed the content of his salvation project through the covenant with Abraham. God refused to be the God of all men, and made his people out of those who obey God's commandments. He declared that he would be the God of his own people. Among those who survived Noah's flood, which was due in part of the first covenant in the last chapter, God delineated who are to become his people, Abraham, Abraham's descendants, and all those who kept God's command to be circumcised. God required circumcision in this covenant because he knows that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, Genesis 6 verse 5. It was a strategic approach to God's salvation project in order to get rid of the sinful human form by making people belong to the true God. Circumcision, a method of cutting off the foreskin of the flesh, marked the people of God. In Jeremiah 4 verse 4 it says to Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. It is the word that expresses God's intention of circumcision for his people. Thus, circumcision means belonging to God, cutting off the flesh so that we can belong to God, who is the true spirit. Explaining his intention to command all of his people to be circumcised, God declared, The Eternal Covenant in Your Flesh God wanted each of them to have a mark that the natural part of their body has been removed so that they can only turn their hearts to God. When I picture God's commandment for circumcision, I could understand that God set and created a new standard for the righteous, especially within a world filled with sin. He required circumcision for his people since all of humanity is only filled with evil desires in their hearts. Thus, there could not be one righteous person. By setting a new standard, he drew a line separating the righteous and wicked. It is not a moral concept, but rather for his people to trust and rely on an invisible God instead of the world by becoming a person who belongs to him. Genesis 15 verses 5 to 6 says, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. God then formed a covenant with Abraham. Because men are sinners, we cannot escape the curse of death, and as the saying goes, For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23 To be set free from death, we must be righteous and not sinners. However, there is no way for us to be free, because we are confined by the curse that we will surely die. Therefore, God's first step to pave a way for sinners to become righteous in God's project of salvation was to make people belong to God. 
With their faith in him, God recognizes them as righteous. Another aspect in which God revealed the content of his salvation project through his covenant with Abraham is that the object of salvation that God envisions encompasses all nations. Although he did not reveal the details of how a person can become the father of all nations, this covenant clearly shows that the object of those who will receive the grace of eternal blessing includes all nations through God's salvation project and his promise to Abraham. There are still many questions regarding God's project of salvation. In particular, the issue of how God approaches his people when they continue to sin even after circumcision, especially since the characteristics of sinners remain, and how a person becomes the father of all nations. Through the covenant with Abraham, God made them belong to him through their faith. God established his people with their trust in God, which was the process of God's salvation project, and God finally gave the people the hope of eternal life. Although Abraham made a covenant with God and obeyed the commandments to circumcise, it was impossible to fully understand and know at that time how God was paving the way for seemingly impossible circumstances such as death. God not only gave his people eternal blessings, but his valuable covenant also extended to provide people throughout the world with the opportunity of eternal blessing. Since Abraham was not able to know or understand God's circumstances in detail, we cannot help but be grateful and moved by this tremendous blessing of eternal life we can now enjoy due to Abraham's faith in following God. Chapter 17 the Covenant with Israel. There are prophecies where God had spoken to Abraham while he was describing the covenant. Genesis 15 verses 13 to 14 says, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge, Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. At the time of the covenant with Abraham, new details concerning God's project of salvation are revealed in the prophecies. More specifically, God's covenants between Noah and Abraham were formed with an individual person, respectively. The subject of the forthcoming covenant is not a person, but rather a nation. The monumental moment highlighted God's planned will for the subject of the covenant to shift from individuals to a nation. According to the word of God's prophecy, eventually the twelve tribes of Israel were created through the twelve sons of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. It was explained to them through Moses in Exodus 6 verses 6 to 8 that God would become their God. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage, I am the Lord. After forming a covenant with Abraham, God's plan was to make a nation out of Abraham's descendants. The entire nation would make up God's people. Following the four hundred years after Noah's flood and the formation of the first covenant, only Abraham turned to God with his whole heart. So according to the prophecy, once Abraham's descendants became strangers in Egypt for 400 years under their heavy burdens and afflictions, God planned to perform his work of salvation for not just one person, but for all people so that they could all experience God and become his people together. As he had planned, God performed many miracles and wonders beyond human imagination to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. 
because all the people of the land experienced God's great deeds and were saved from slavery in Egypt, a covenant was formed between God and the people in the wilderness who experienced him. The following are the words regarding God allowing all people to experience him through miracles and make them become people of God, who is the only God. Deuteronomy 4 verses 32-35 for ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other, whether any great thing like this has happened, or anything like it has been heard. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and live? Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation, by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown, that you might know that the Lord himself is God, there is none other besides him. Exodus 34 verses 27 to 28 Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, he neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. The verses state that the contents of the covenant with Israel is the content of the Ten Commandments whom the Lord wrote directly onto the tablets. The contents of the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus 20 verses 3 to 17. Exodus 20 verses 3 to 17. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The following is Moses' explanation of the content of the covenant and the requirements of God, while demanding not to forget the word of the covenant and its commandments. Deuteronomy 10 verses 12 to 16 And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good. Indeed heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers, to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and be stiff-necked no longer. What God wants is for our hearts to love Him. 
Jesus also explained the most important commandments whom God required and desired. Matthew 22 verses 37 to 40 Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our mental image of the physical laws and commandments through God and Israel's covenant found in the Old Testament is similar to the image historically shown by the Pharisees and scribes. However, God only asks for and desires from us is a heart that loves him with all our heart and mind. Moses was the one who directly heard the content of the covenant from God and preached the content of the covenant to the people of Israel. If we look at the details of Moses' command to the people, we can clearly see the emphasis on asking the people to love God with all their hearts. The following are the words proclaimed through Moses on the importance of loving God. Exodus 20 verse 6, Showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 5 verse 10, But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, Keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 10 verse 12, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 11 verse 1, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 11 verse 13, To love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 19 verse 9, To love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Deuteronomy 30 verse 16, I command you today to love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 30 verse 20, That you may love the Lord your God. In addition to these verses, there are many others which ask us to love God but the content above is limited to the words stated by Moses who heard God's commandments and delivered them to the people at the time of the covenant's formation. To establish this third covenant with Israel, God performed enormous miracles for all the people of Israel and saved them from their sufferings. The only request he made to the people of Israel was for them to love God. Although God repeatedly asked them to love God for their own blessings, since loving God is the only way they could receive eternal blessings, they did not understand God's heart, just as we do now. Chapter 18 The Covenant of Priesthood In the last chapter, we discussed that the covenants between Noah and Abraham, respectively, were covenants with individuals, whereas the covenant with Israel was a covenant between God and a nation. Meaning that there are aspects of God's salvation project in which he specifically planned and worked on to change the subject of the covenant from individual recipients to a whole nation. We will check particular aspects that God has used in his project of salvation through the covenant with Israel. In the verses below, he speaks on the new work that was established through the covenant with Israel. Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6 You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. These verses clearly indicate God's performance of miraculous feats to save the people of Israel from Egypt. God has shown very clearly that He owns the entire world. To the people who experienced the miracles of God, He invited them to become His own people, saying that they would become a kingdom of priests. One of the new aspects of God's salvation project that emerges through this covenant focuses on the priest. He planned to make the whole nation of Israel a kingdom of priests, and within the nation of Israel, God appointed priests among them to perform the role God had originally wanted since the covenant with Israel. Regarding the work of priests who play a very important role in the history of God's project of salvation, we require more insight into their role, meaning, and importance. One of the other covenants made at that time was the covenant of priesthood. God made a priesthood covenant with Aaron's grandson Phinehas. Phinehas was furious at the sin of the Israelites and punished the sinners of Israel so that the punishment for their sins would not extend over the whole nation. God then announced that he would enter into a covenant of everlasting priesthood with Phinehas and his descendants. Numbers 25:11-13 Phinehas the son of Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made atonement for the children of Israel. Due to our misconceptions of good and evil, we misunderstand God many times. As discussed in the previous book, we are sinners who ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result, we distinguish between good and evil based on the standard of the tree of knowledge. God, however, distinguishes between good and evil by the standard of the tree of life. We believe that our internal moral standard of distinguishing between good and evil and pursuing the good within it would be acceptable to God. If we distinguish good and evil from the moral standard of good and evil, it means that all who live by doing good deeds with a good heart from any religion can obtain eternal life. It is the claim of the people who insist that all religions are one. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is death. On the other hand, the fruit of the tree of life is life. We, as humans, are all sinners, and we are the darkness. Only God is light, and only when we belong to God we can have life in the light. If we look at the content of the covenant made with Phinehas above, we can see the difference between God's concept of good and evil from our concept of good and evil caused by the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Numbers 25 1-8 speaks of the circumstances in which Aaron's grandson Phinehas won God's heart. Numbers 25 1-8 Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, 
And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. God formed a covenant with Israel to make the people of Israel his people and a kingdom of priests. But as mentioned above, humans are sinners in darkness. Unless we belong to God, we are bound to perish because of our sins. Even so, God allowed his people to belong to him through the covenant of circumcision. However, circumcision is to be done in the heart. In Jeremiah 4 verse 4, which says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your hearts. It is to put away our sinful nature and belong to the Lord. Therefore, just by belonging to our Lord, we would not be destroyed by darkness. In Numbers 25, however, Israel began to commit harlotry with the Moabite women bowing down before the Moabites' God. This made the people of Israel belong to Baal Peor, the god of Moab. This serious problem would eventually lead to a situation where Israel, a kingdom of priests belonging to God, would cease to belong to God. This also means that God will no longer be able to carry out the project of salvation that will save all people through Israel, the kingdom of the priests. This sin could have impeded God's work of giving humanity eternal life by establishing the eternal covenant. At that time, Phinehas, Aaron's grandson, a priest who knew God's circumstances and wrath, suppressed the progression of that sin in the field by punishing them. Numbers 25 13 states Phinehas did so because he was zealous for his God. When we view this story of Phinehas from the Bible, we can see how often our misconception of right and wrong leads us to misunderstand God, preventing us from knowing God's will. Since our conception of right and wrong is so misconstrued, we cannot understand God's situations and plans. When we cannot understand God's situation, we cannot act on God's side like Phinehas had. As we live doing things that God hates and displeases Him, our misunderstanding of God leads us to believe that we still live for God. When we are governed by our wrong concepts of good and evil, we continue to fail to understand. There were many countries around Israel, and the people who lived may not all be morally bad people. Moreover, not all Israelites would have been morally good people. Especially in this age, it's hard for us to understand why they should be completely separated from people from other countries, not to get along with them or marry them. But when we know the words of the Bible in detail, we can see that what God forbids is not restricted to ethnicity. Exodus 12 verses 48 and 49 says this. Exodus 12 verses 48 and 49 says this. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Genesis 17 verse 14 And the uncircumcised male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. More specifically, one's ancestors, one's country of origin, and one's home is not the focus here. The focus is whether they want to belong to the Lord, their heart is the focus. So if a Gentile wants to belong to God, be the people of God, and undergo circumcision as a sign of the people of God, the word says that they will become like the people of Israel. Although Israelites are the people of God, those who do not want to belong to God will be cut off from the people. That is, the people who want to belong to God will be God's people. 
God wants to establish a kingdom of priests with those people, but having relationships with people who worship other gods in other lands and follow their customs made people not belong to God. Thus, would make it impossible for God to establish a priesthood, therefore, God could not allow it. Altogether, we can clearly see that thinking about whether we are morally good or bad according to our standards of right and wrong has nothing to do with gaining eternal life. Although a Gentile lives doing good works all his life with a good heart but does not want to become God's people and belong to God, then he cannot have eternal life in the kingdom of God. Because all human beings are darkness and only God is light, we cannot be saved from our sins unless we belong to God. We will then study the meaning and purpose of God's establishment of priests from the Word which explains what God wants for the priesthood. Malachi 2 verses 4 to 7 Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me, so he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. It was with Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron of the tribe of Levi, whom God made the covenant of the priests, as explained above. The verses above list several things Phinehas had done which pleased God. He feared God. He was reverent before God's name. The law of truth was in his mouth. Injustice was not found in his lips. He walked with God in peace and equity. He turned many away from iniquity. Then, God explains what kind of priest he wants. Lips of a priest should keep knowledge. People should seek the law from his mouth, should be the messenger of the Lord of hosts. God's purpose in establishing the priesthood was because he wanted to raise up messengers of God who would lead people to the path of blessing, those who would eventually lead them to eternal life while allowing people to live in the midst of the word of the law, which is life. I can now better understand. God's purpose and plan was to establish the priesthood that among many people, not all people could have the same heart. Instead, many people would receive the blessing of eternal life because of God's messenger leading them on the path of blessing. I then remembered the words which explained God's plan. God had already explained to this Abraham when the project of salvation was announced to him. Genesis 12 verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Since God wanted to share the blessing of obtaining eternal life with all peoples of the earth, he had planned channels for the blessing to be delivered into and flow out of. God's intention and plan was to establish a priesthood to establish channels of blessing and for many people to be blessed through those channels. Contrary to God's intention for those who belong to God become channels of blessing and flow blessings to others, there has been a history of continued disobedience since the covenant with Israel. However, God's fulfillment and accomplishments of covenants is God's history of salvation for mankind, and such content will be revealed through ongoing covenants. Chapter 19 The Covenant with David When we covered the covenant with Israel, we discussed that the reason God commands us to love him is not only because he wants to receive our love, but for our blessing and the only way to be saved. God knows all too well the situation in which we are bound to perish if we do not love God with all our heart, mind, and strength. When we do not live in the eyes of God, when we do not want only His approval, and when we do not live in the fear of God alone, 
we automatically become aware of the eyes of the people. We chase after what is recognized by the world and fear the world. If we do not love God, we are destined to become hypocrites. Since hypocrites belong to darkness, we become blind and cannot even return to God, who is light for us to see. In the end, there is no choice left but to perish. So in this world, our only option is to love God with all our heart, mind, and strength by living a life that only follows God. In order to bless his people, God continued to cry out for them to love him, but the Israelites continued to disobey God. After the passing of another 450 years, God finds someone after his own heart. An explanation of its contents is found in the Acts of the Apostles. Acts 13 verses 17 to 22 The God of this people Israel chose our fathers, and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about forty years he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that he gave them judges for about four hundred and fifty years, until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. God fervently sought a person who understands his situations, abides by the true meaning of God's law, and aligns their heart and will with God's heart and will. When Abraham believed in God and fully followed God, God was so happy and delighted in it. For that reason, God poured out his overflowing love and even promised eternal blessings to all nations. When Phinehas became angry for God's side upon realizing God's situation and became a representative of God, God rejoiced so much even to establish an everlasting priesthood covenant. I feel very sorry for God who is waiting and looking for those who love him so much for us and to bless us. But I am very grateful that through the one person, David, who obeyed God, all of humanity has enjoyed God's tremendous blessings. The content of the covenant with David can be found in 2 Samuel 7 verses 8 to 16. 2 Samuel 7 verses 8 to 16. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more, as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. It is about God's promise that his house, his kingdom, and his throne will be established forever. It is because of this promise from God that Jesus in the New Testament was called. 
Jesus, the Son of David. As we learn about the different covenants established by God, we can see how much influence one man's sincere obedience can have on the world. Through the covenant with Israel, God built them a kingdom of priests and wanted to save all nations. He went on to ask them to only love God and to belong to God, not to the world. However, the Israelites continued to disobey and turned their hearts away from God and instead towards the world. A covenant is a promise made on both sides, and God faithfully kept His promise. He wanted to bless them, but the people continued to break their promise and refused to love God. They were unable to function as a kingdom of priests due to their disobedience. Despite the twelve tribes of Israel's inability to grow into God's planned priesthood kingdom, it was through David's faith and covenant with God where God blessed the priesthood work of the tribe of Judah. This tribe and the descendants of David abided by the covenant and would continue the channels of God's blessings until God's fulfillment of all the covenants. I can't help but declare that it was the result of his great blessing and the grace of God. When we look at David's faith, which became a channel of great blessings, there are many things we need to learn from. We make songs of praise from the Psalms of David and we also frequently study the Bible about David saying that he is the man after God's own heart. However, we do not have his faith. There is no work of faith in our lives that serves as channels for blessings. The Christian churches became congregations of religious social meetings and now stand in a position where the church is ridiculed by the world. The light does not shine from the children of God, who should be light in this world. There are precise differences between us and David that we can detect. We are hypocrites, but David was not a hypocrite. His proclamation in his Psalms makes it clear that he was not a hypocrite. Psalm 7 verse 9, For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. David lived before the eyes of God, realizing that God is the one who examines our hearts and minds. He was not a hypocrite because lived in the sight of God. Psalm 27 verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? David was not a hypocrite because he did not fear anything in the world but trusted only in God. Psalm 32 verse 2, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Realizing that God is the judge of our souls, David was not a hypocrite because he feared God who condemns and judges. Psalm 33 verse 15 He fashions their hearts individually, he considers all their works. David was not a hypocrite because he lived recognizing the God who cared for everyone's heart and what everyone does. Psalm 34 verse 18 the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. A broken heart, a contrite heart, and a poor heart before God are the hearts that humble us and exalt God alone. David, who exalts God, was not a hypocrite. Psalm 56 verse 11 In God I have put my trust, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? David was not a hypocrite because he trusted only in God and did not fear men. Psalm 118 verse 6 The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? David was not on the side of the world, but on God's side. David, who did not fear the world from God's side, was not a hypocrite. Psalm 119 verse 113 I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Having a double-minded heart is hypocrisy. But David hates hypocrisy and screams that he loves God's law.
David, who hated hypocrisy, was not a hypocrite. Because David was not a hypocrite, he could love God with all his heart, depend on and trust God alone, and be used as a channel of blessing from God. We cannot deny how important it is to examine our heart and see if our whole heart is directed only towards God. Chapter 20 New Covenant After the covenant with David was made, the recurring history of not keeping the covenant, disobeying God, and betraying God continued. Again, it is because the people did not want to keep the covenant while God was faithfully fulfilling it. Even if the covenant could not be fulfilled, it would be impossible to deny that God is a just God. During the darkest and most disobedient moment, however, God proclaims a covenant different from the covenants he has made so far. Until then, covenants were made with humans, such as Noah, Abraham, Israel, David, and Phinehas. However, at this time, God has declared that he himself will fulfill the everlasting covenant while still keeping the covenant obligations that people must fulfill. In Isaiah 33 verse 22, the words of the prophecy say, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. It is a promise that the Lord himself will be our judge and king to save us. Also, Psalm 110 verse 4 states, The Lord has sworn, and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, God has assumed the role of priest, the channel of blessing, and proclaimed that he will open the way to eternal life for human beings. The fact that there is an eternal priest means that God has opened the way of eternal blessing to mankind. Although, The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart, Genesis 6 verse 6. Prior to making the covenant with Noah, he decided to give humanity eternal life, continued to establish covenants, and fulfilled the covenants according to God's project of salvation. At the end of the history, he did not make another covenant with mankind, but rather gave himself up and established an eternal priest as a channel of eternal blessings, a role whom God assumed by taking on the obligations of both sides of the covenants. God's promise of the new covenant was proclaimed through the words of various prophets. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The subject of the content of God's new covenant is the heart. It provided in such a context that God works directly in our hearts. I would like to express my curiosity regarding how God would do something that was considered impossible for thousands of years. Instead, making people obey and love God would make it possible now. The expression from the Bible states that God will put his heart in us, but I question how it can be done. I also question God's confidence in people following the covenant. How can he be so sure that this time around, humanity will not break his new covenant? In other verses, he also explains how God is working in our hearts. Jeremiah 32 verses 38 to 41 they shall be my people, and I will be their God, then I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and their children after them.
and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land, with all my heart and with all my soul. It says God will give them one heart and one way. The subject of the giver is God. These verses also explain that God will put the fear of God in their hearts. Even with these words, the question of how to achieve it cannot be ruled out. Isaiah 59 verse 21 As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Through these words, it is proclaimed that the dwelling place of God will be among us. In doing so, he declared that he will be our God, and we will be God's people. Reading the prophecies about the new covenant, I couldn't help but think that is not what we are to do, but that it is entirely what God will do. It was a declaration of the goals whom God himself would accomplish. God will work in our hearts. He will put his word in our hearts. He will not allow the Spirit of God to depart from our mouth. He will put the fear of God in our hearts, and he will make his dwelling place ours. A covenant is a promise made by both parties, but in the new covenant, God's proclamation means that he will independently fulfill even our duties which we cannot fulfill due to our weakness. God will ultimately fulfill the everlasting covenant but we can't help but wonder how he would do it. The fulfillment of the promise above can be found in the New Testament. Romans 8 verses 1 to 4 There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God made it possible for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it is the works of God which will be fulfilled to the ones who walk according to the Spirit. Also, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We can become the righteousness of God when we are in him. Ultimately, what the Word explains is that the content of how the New Covenant will be fulfilled is revealed through the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It is through the work of both Jesus and the Holy Spirit that God's project of salvation, which has been carried out throughout human history, is finally accomplished. When we can understand the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit from the perspective of God, who has continued the work of salvation for humanity, we will be able to better know and understand God. The next chapter will deal with God's work in fulfilling the covenant through the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 21 Fulfillment of Covenants In the last chapter, we discussed the content of God's declaration of the new covenant which, Despite the continued disobedience and betrayal of the people, God could fulfill the everlasting covenant by observing the covenantal obligation of both parties. We also discussed that the fulfillment of the new covenant was made through the works of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We will look at the works of Jesus and the Holy Spirit to discover how God finally made it possible even though we were bound by the curse of God who had said we would surely die. There was no way we could have eternal life. 
When God made covenants with Noah, Abraham, Israel, and David, he repeatedly said that it was a covenant that would be established forever. Since we are sinners confined to the curse that we will surely die, however, we cannot obtain eternal life until the problem of sin is resolved. From the beginning, human beings could not be subject to the eternal covenant. Therefore, God established a new standard whom God recognizes as the righteousness of depending, believing, and belonging to God. For that standard to be actualized, we needed the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of our sins tied to the curse. When God formed the covenant with Israel, he established detailed sacrificial laws and ordered sacrifices to wash away people's sins through the shedding of animal blood. Until the new covenant was established with us, who are confined under the curse of sin, shedding animal blood through sacrifice was a temporary way to solve our sin problem. This is explained in detail in Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9 verses 18 to 20. Therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Since there is no remission without the shedding of blood, it is said to be the blood of the covenant. The verses above explain the content of temporarily continuing the forgiveness of people's sins with the blood of animals. The verses below describe the history of enabling us to enjoy the eternal forgiveness of sins through the shedding of the blood of Jesus, not the temporary forgiveness by the blood of the animals, making us the people of God who would receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9 verses 13 to 15 For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The verses above explain Jesus' work in fulfilling the new covenant and exactly states that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. It also explains how we, who were confined by the curse of death, receive the eternal blessing of the new covenant through the blood of Christ. Even the Almighty God could not do anything contrary to what He had said. In order to give eternal life to those who were confined by the curse of death, God had to pay the penalty for our sins. The shedding of Jesus' blood broke the chains for us to be freed from His curse. In Matthew 26 verse 28, Jesus speaks of the fulfillment of the covenant that He made possible. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This verse also explains that to solve our problem of the curse of death, Jesus, who had no sin, had to take the curse of our sins. Therefore, God opened the way for us to be recognized as righteous when we belong to God and believe in him. We know the story of Jesus taking our sins and dying for us very well, so this is nothing new. However, we want to know in detail how this relates to the new covenant and how God makes it possible for himself to put his heart in us. An explanation is given in the verses below. John 7 verses 37 to 39 On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, 
out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The verses above explain how the work of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit are connected. The way the Holy Spirit enters us is when that person comes to believe in Jesus. After Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. So when people believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into them, which is the Spirit of God promised through the New Covenant. So, God's promise that the fear of God and the Word of God would be in our heart is fulfilled. John 14 verses 16 and 17 And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another Helper, that he may abide with you forever the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It is an explanation that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth, sent by God after his departure, will dwell in us. Romans 8 verses 9 to 11 But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. It is an explanation about when the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Christ, is in us after the departure of Jesus, we can be released from the curse of death and enjoy eternal life. Those who have the Spirit of Christ are endowed with the work that Jesus did, which is the work of priests. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Revelation 1 verse 6 And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 20 verse 6 Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It is said that those who receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ would become priests of Christ, doing the work of proclaiming the greatness and marvelous works of God. God's project of salvation is ultimately accomplished by fulfilling God's covenant with the role of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and God's people who have received the Spirit of God in their hearts assume the role of priests, the channel of blessings. Finally, the path to eternal blessing is open to all those who were impossible to obtain. However, looking back at the history of salvation through God's covenant, we cannot help but look back on our state. I can't help but think that the standards set by God for us to be His people are very different from the standards that we set. To become God's people, the people who lived before the coming of Jesus had to love God with all their body, mind, heart, and strength, be dependent on God, not the world, and fear God without fearing the world. But after the coming of Jesus, to become the people of God is to believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. For this reason, all Christians who have confessed Jesus as their Savior live in the belief that they are God's people. But there is a problem here. When we say that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, because Jesus is the Lord of our lives, our hearts would of course love God with all our mind, hearts, and strength. 
We would live in fear of God without trusting in the world. Those who have received Jesus as our Savior do not live for us. Instead, Jesus lives in us, so of course, we would become those who do not fear the world and who completely belong to God. However, when we look at whether the fulfillment of God's covenant, which has been fulfilled through the history of all mankind, is manifested through our Christian life, it is no different from the time of disobedience of the Israelites. He gave us the new covenant, shed his blood for us, paid the penalty for our sins, and fulfilled all covenants, but we cannot find the heart of the Holy Spirit in Christians who claim to be God's people. Since there cannot be a problem with the Word of God, we must look at our problems. Are we the ones who have received the blessings of the new covenant? Are we living the life of a priest? Are we living in the fear of God without fearing the world? Are we really God's people? These are very important questions for our lives. Chapter 22 Examine yourselves. As we observe the tremendous love, patience, and goodness that God had for us through His covenants, we cannot help but marvel at His greatness. However, when we think about whether the promise of God's new covenant has been fulfilled through the lives of Christians who claim to be God's people, it is not easy to find the fruits of the fulfillment of God's word. It is not easy to see the realization of the promise of the new covenant to put the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the fear of God into the hearts of the people of God. So I couldn't help but think of the importance of taking the time to check our faith. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. This is very important because we live in a time when we still have the opportunity to repent. The time will soon come when there will be no opportunity left to do so. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Now is the acceptable time because we can repent. Clearly, no one can deny that the way we Christians are today is not how God wants us to be. However, that is not the case when we think about whether we were trying to figure out the problem, find the problem, or try to solve that problem. What many people believe is that many Bible scholars study the Bible exceedingly, and Christianity has grown so large because many Christian leaders pray immensely. Many believe that it would not be necessary to look further into the Bible regarding the current state of Christianity. However, our zeal to study the Bible cannot compare to that of the Pharisees, nor can we compare to the scribes who prayed and dedicated themselves to copying the Bible. Their actions and dedication, however, do not mean that they were examining and testing their beliefs correctly. More often than not, we desire to live a life of faith for ourselves instead of living a life of faith for God. Most people do not want to delve into the problem and find the hidden truth. Very important things may be hidden, but people do not want to worry about it because the current state of Christianity is preferred to be comfortable. People console their hearts by doing the best they can in churches while burying the problems that even non-Christians can see within Christianity. There is also the fear of not being able to find solutions, even if we do find the problems. Luke 13 verses 23 to 24 says, Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. However, we do not try to enter through the narrow gate, 
we do not even consider that only a few may be saved. 1 Peter 4 verses 17 to 18 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? The standard of salvation that the Bible explains is very different from what Christians today think, but we don't even want to consider getting to know it better. Luke 18 verse 8 says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? The Bible talks about how difficult it is to find faith in the world, but now Christians think that we all have the faith that saves us. As we came to know and confirm the content of the previous book through history, we were able to realize that we did not know God. We did not live in fear of God. We lived by setting the standard to please God much lower than what God really sets, and we lived like the blind with our eyes closed. The message of the ancestors of the faith who kept their faith while suffering martyrdom was burned, discarded, and corrupted by the power of darkness. We failed to realize that, rather, we were busy building big churches, big organizations, and big associations. We were satisfied thinking that the influence of Christianity was growing and developing. But when we look at the message of faith that has remained in history, we can more clearly see that our faith is not the faith that pleases God. From the writings of the ancestors of faith, and also from the words of God, it is very clearly proclaimed that a life of loving God with all our heart fearing God alone without fearing the world, and living a life in which we die but Jesus lives is God's standard for our lives. Although I searched through all the verses of the Bible thinking that perhaps it would not be possible to set such a high standard for all the people in the world, I could not find a single verse in the Bible that recognized devotion that was lower than the standard of God as faith. Our current state is that we acknowledge the object of destruction when Jesus returns. We acknowledge that the object will be recognized as the power of hypocrites. We also acknowledge that hypocrisy will put all the people of the world on the side of darkness. However, we have the desire to verify what may be the least extreme standard that we can meet and still come out of the power of darkness while being on God's side. Obviously, if we live loving God every moment with the devotion to surrender our lives to Him, it would be the best option with no need to look for other alternatives. However, we are in a state where we have some doubts on whether the standard cannot be adjusted for anyone. We have a question if the absolute standard would apply to all people. In order for God to speak directly to our hearts and confirm it, we should check our situation only in the light of the Word. This is so that we can have the opportunity to make a devotion that no doubt arises by confirming it through the Word. Chapter 23 Are We Christians? The reason we want to affirm the faith that God receives through our study of the Bible is because we have a heart that truly desires eternal life. No matter how richly and magnificently we can enjoy the mundane in this short world, it cannot be compared to eternal life in the kingdom where God lives. Therefore, we sincerely want to obtain eternal life. However, Jesus said that some were allowed to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven and not others. He states in Matthew 13 verse 11, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Matthew 13 verses 11 to 15, He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. 
For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Mark 4 verses 11 and 12 And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn, and their sins be forgiven them. Luke 8 verse 10 And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. The verses above explain that there are some who are not allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and that is why Jesus said that when he spoke of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, he spoke only in parables. It is explained that it is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, so that those who are not allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven cannot see, hear, or understand. This is the word we hear a lot about. However, we make a mistake here. Since the Bible says, It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Without thinking or doubting it, we think I am the one who was allowed to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. We do not even doubt that we would belong to them, who are not allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Then, on what basis do we think we are allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven? If we think that way without an exact reason, where can we find the basis? By what criteria did Jesus separate those who were allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom from those who were not? However, the Bible clearly explains the difference between those who have revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and those who have not been allowed to listen to the mysteries of the kingdom. Mark 4 verse 34 But without a parable he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Luke 8 verses 9 to 10 Then his disciples asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. After all, the disciples were you who were allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and the crowd besides the disciples were they who were not allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That is, the disciples were those who were granted the privilege of knowing the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. During his public life, Jesus continued to invite people into the life of the disciples, the followers of Jesus. However, the invitation was not at a level that could be easily accepted without a burden. Jesus had very clear rules for being his disciple. When the Lord called people as disciples who were given the privilege of knowing the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, he set them a very precise and clear standard through his word on how to become disciples. The following Bible verses are words about the criteria for becoming disciples invited by Jesus. Luke 14 verses 26 to 33 if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, 
does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it lest, after he has laid the foundation, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish? Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him who comes against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Mark 8 verses 34 to 38 When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The one who hates even his own life. The one who takes his cross and follows the Lord. The one who has given up all that he has. For those who do not meet these standards, he declared. He cannot be my disciple. Without any compromise, the level of devotion that even demands life. So why was such devotion necessary of us to the Lord? Jesus came to this world to preach the gospel of the kingdom, and Jesus explained the gospel of the kingdom with many parables about the seeds. John 12 verse 24 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. Only when a grain of wheat dies then can it bear fruit. This truth is the truth of the resurrection. In other words, the message that Jesus wanted to tell us is the message of the resurrection. It is a message that cannot be experienced without death. So the dedication of even giving one's life was a prerequisite for understanding the message of heaven and the message of the resurrection. After the resurrection of Jesus, he met with his disciples and asked them to share the message of the kingdom of heaven they had learned from him. Jesus' standard continues to apply, even entrusting them with that task. The method of preaching the gospel of the kingdom Jesus entrusted to his disciples was for those who became disciples of Jesus to make disciples of others, so that the gospel of the kingdom could be known at the level of disciples. That is why, before ascending to heaven, the last words he asked his disciples were, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. There is no word in the Bible that states those who became disciples through the disciples can have a lower standard of devotion. After the disciples fully dedicated themselves and learned the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven based on the truth of the resurrection, those disciples were to make disciples who could also learn the truth of the resurrection, so that to all nations the gospel of the kingdom of heaven could be preached. Jesus did not tell us to make parishioners, those who dedicate themselves to church, or those who pray a lot, but to make disciples. The history of obeying Jesus' words, making disciples, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom is found in the book of Acts. Acts 6 verse 7 Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Acts 14 verse 21 
And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Acts 14 verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. The book of Acts clearly says that the number of disciples has increased, not that the number of church members has increased. Acts 11 verse 26 says, And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It was the disciples who came to be called Christians in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians. The Bible clearly says that it was not the members of the church who were called Christians, but the disciples who were called Christians. So again, we will have to think about whether we are those who are allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven or those who are not allowed to know. Those who hate even their own lives, those who take up their cross and follow the Lord, and those who have renounced all that they have or deemed the Lord's disciples. Without such dedication, we are not the Lord's disciples. In this sense, we are the ones who see but do not see. We hear, but do not hear, and we do not understand. Therefore, we are those who are not allowed to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Furthermore, we are not Christians since the title of Christians is what the disciples of Jesus were called. Matthew 13 verse 11 states that, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. We are not you, but them. What Jesus came for and preached to his disciples was to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first thing he asked us to do was repent. But while we mistakenly think that it is us who allow us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, even though we do not hold that authority, we were missing the opportunity to repent. Also, by thinking that we are Christians, even though we are not, we were missing the opportunity to repent. It was a plea, a request, and an invitation from Jesus when he told us to repent. With repentance, the fact that the kingdom of heaven is near will be a blessing, and without repentance, that fact will be a curse. Chapter 24 The Reason for Not Allowing to Know the Mysteries of Heaven I understand the disciples were the only ones who God revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven to, but I fail to understand his method of why he did. Isn't it God who wants all people of this world to obtain salvation? Wouldn't it be better for people to first learn the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, eventually open their hearts, and then begin to dedicate themselves to God. I could not help but to ask these questions. Moreover, there was a parable in the Bible that answered my questions. Matthew 25 verses 1 to 12 Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. 
This is the well-known parable of the ten virgins. This parable describes five virgins who were wise and took oil with them, and the other five virgins were foolish and did not bring oil when they went to meet the bridegroom. To understand this parable, we must first understand the meaning of the wise and the foolish. In the original Greek language, wise is phronimos which means wise and having wisdom. The following Bible verses are about wisdom, being wise. Psalm 111 verse 10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. Proverbs 9 verse 10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 15 verse 33 The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Isaiah 11 verse 2 The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 33 verse 6 Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. We can draw from the verses above that having wisdom is to fear the Lord. As we discussed in previous chapters, to fear God is to live in the eyes of the Lord. So the five wise virgins in the parable were those who fear God. And the five virgins were said to be foolish virgins. The word foolish here is translated as moros in the original language, which means foolish and absurd. So, looking at real examples of the use of moros in the Old Testament, we will see what God called foolish. 1 Samuel 13 verses 8 to 14 Then he waited seven days, according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me a Gildal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. The verse above explains what happened in the midst of the battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. The Israelites waited for Samuel to come and sacrifice to God first. However, Saul started the sacrifice himself instead of waiting for Samuel in fear of the people scattering. Samuel rebuked Saul for his foolish action and claimed that his throne would be lost as a result. Samuel said, You have done foolishly, to Saul for his action which was done because he feared the people. His fear of the people was greater than his fear of God. Saul knew that he was not a priest to offer sacrifices very clearly and knowingly broke God's law. Saul knew that he would make God feel very angry. Due to Saul's fear of the people scattering, his action is seen as fearing man over God. After all, fool means living in fear of people not fearing God. Another example in the Bible is found in 2 Chronicles 16. 
2 Chronicles 16 verses 6 to 9. Then King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Basha had used for building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. And at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. The story above describes King Asa being reprimanded by the seer Hanani. As the king of Judah, King Asa had the experience of defeating the million armies of Cush when he prayed and trusted God. Instead of trusting God, however, King Asa sent gold and silver to King Ben-Hadad of Syria for help during the face of Israel's attack. Hanani the seer said that King Asa had acted foolishly. Judah was asking the Gentiles for help in an attack on Israel. King Asa's trust was in other nations, rather than in God. He relied on other nations, so being foolish means, according to these verses, that trusting people instead of trusting God is to be foolish. Looking at the two examples, the word foolish can be very clearly understood. To be foolish is not living in the eyes of God, seeking approval from people instead of seeking God's approval, and fearing and trusting other people over God. Therefore, to be a hypocrite is to be foolish. So I can now understand why Jesus allowed the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven for some and not for others. The virgins who feared God knew that the bridegroom would come, and the virgins who were hypocrites also knew that the bridegroom would come. Since the virgins who fear God were the ones who live before the eyes of God and sincerely await the coming of the bridegroom, they had oils. Knowing that when the bridegroom arrives without oil, it is impossible to light the lamp. That is why the sincere heart of waiting for the bridegroom and having oil to light the lamp was something so natural and essential that it cannot be avoided or forgotten. However, the hypocritical virgins fear God externally and lack a real heart. Their heart was towards the world and did not have a sincere heart to wait for the bridegroom. So although they missed the most important thing, they could not realize it because they did not have the heart for it. As they were blinded by hypocrisy, they did not realize that they were missing the most precious thing, their heart. Therefore, Knowing that the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is a blessing for those who fear only God and do not fear the world, it can create situations for those who do not fear God where they would be hypocrites. Even the foolish virgins outwardly look like those who were genuinely waiting for the bridegroom. However, their heart was not actually waiting for the bridegroom. Knowing the fact that the bridegroom was coming acted as a tool for their hypocritical actions that made them look like they were sincerely awaiting the bridegroom. It is very understandable as to why Jesus set a standard for the disciples and only made it known to them about the revelation of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It is very understandable that all the precious words of God have no choice but to be used as instruments of hypocrisy for those who do not have the heart to fully love and follow God. At the same time, I feel fear and trembling over the current situation of Christianity. How much in the history of our Christianity have we used the Word of God to establish Christianity without fearing God and without loving God with all our heart? How many times have we used the Word of God as a tool of blessing for us, 
without fearing God and without loving God with all our heart. I felt mournful as I thought that we had all become hypocrites in this way. Nevertheless, we cannot help but be thankful for the grace of God who still wants to awaken us. Chapter 25 Christian's Gratitude We now know that Jesus required disciple-level devotion for all who come to him, that doing so would prevent us from becoming hypocrites in the fear of God. There was something that worried me. Most of the New Testament epistles were written to the churches. However, as we shared in the previous chapter, the disciples made disciples and their numbers increased. The gathering of those disciples was called churches. At that time, declaring Jesus as Savior and dedicating themselves as disciples of the Lord was a commitment to accept all risks and sacrifices. Without such devotion, we take advantage of words of comfort and blessings as if they were personal blessings to us in the message delivered to the disciples of Jesus. As a result, I couldn't help but think that wrongly formed misconceptions would block our true beliefs. I then thought it would be very necessary to look back at our misconceptions that may have been incorrectly formed by re-establishing the correct concepts in the Word. Then, I noticed that there are many Christians who are so thankful for God's grace that they always give thanks, even if they do not have the level of devotion of disciples. I thought it could be a sacrifice and a devotion that would please God. So I wanted to draw upon the gratitude of Christians. Psalm 50 verse 23 says, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who sets his way properly, I will show the salvation of God. Thanksgiving is said to glorify God and please Him. Therefore, the Church places a lot of emphasis on gratitude, and the zeal for leading a life of gratitude in everything can be seen in many Christians. Therefore, it is necessary to check if our gratitude is aimed in the right way which pleases God, or if we do not glorify God because of our misplaced gratitude. This is because God said, To him who sets his way properly, I will show the salvation of God. This means that our behavior of giving thanks may or may not be proper. It reminded me of the things of gratitude that we often hear in our prayers and Christian conversations. Thank you for the special grace that God has given me. Thank you for the blessings that have allowed me to enjoy what others do not enjoy. Thank you for being specially chosen and blessed. However, in the midst of these thanksgiving prayers, a feeling of comparison is felt. Thanksgiving offered by comparing with those who did not receive the same grace and blessings. A sense of superiority in enjoying a special grace in accepting Jesus. A thought that came to me of a prayer. The Pharisee's Prayer in Luke 18 It was a prayer of thanksgiving for enjoying the blessing of being chosen and living in a righteous way, a prayer of thanksgiving to God for allowing him to live in a godly way compared to sinners. I can't help but think that our prayers are very similar to those of the Pharisees. When we find ourselves in a difficult situation, we see someone in a less fortunate situation than ours and think that we should be grateful anyway. We think that seeing people in worse situations and finding strength and gratitude is a way of living without getting tired every moment, without losing gratitude. However, it is a blessing if we get closer to God because of a difficult situation. If we are not drawn closer to Him because of the blessings we enjoy, it is a curse. That is why nothing in this world can be compared, comforted, and appreciated. Furthermore, people really like anything that is considered special. 
The word that is always mentioned when praying and blessing in the church is special. Thanks for the special affection. Thanks for the special blessing. Thanks for the special grace. Even when God tells me that He loves me, if His love for everyone is the same and doesn't feel particularly special for me, then I do not feel love and it does not touch my heart. We believe that value increases when there are special aspects. Superior to the others. Chosen among others. More special than others. However, God's love is the love of anyone and whosoever. Romans 10 verse 13 For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mark 3 verse 35 for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Luke 14 verse 27 And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Matthew 10 verse 33 But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 3 But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Romans 10 verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Certainly, our gratitude is not what God would appreciate. If so, how should our gratitude be changed for the right gratitude that pleases God? Psalm 50 verse 23, shared earlier, says, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to him who sets his way properly I will show the salvation of God. It explains about the th sacrifice of thanksgiving. God is talking about the heart of offering sacrifices to him. He tells us about the heart throughout the Bible, but we only understand it through actions or outward appearances, not by the heart. If we think of the heart that is most pleased with the sacrifices brought to God, then we would know the heart that God would be pleased with when we thank God. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart these, O God, you will not despise. That is, those who bring sacrifices with thanksgiving that God is most pleased with have a broken and contrite heart, their hearts are humbled, and they are moved and touched by the great love of God. Luke 18 verse 13 says, And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. The reason why Jesus spoke of the tax collector's prayer, who had a contrite and broken heart, as a justified prayer becomes very clear. Instead of boasting or comparing, he cries out to God with a broken heart seeking forgiveness. Comparatively, Christians have become like the Pharisees with exalted hearts thinking that we have been specially chosen simply by accepting Jesus, thus, we have become hypocrites like the Pharisees. It cannot be denied that our gratitude is similar to that of the Pharisees. Hearts are exalted and eyes are soaked in the perspective of the world. Therefore, we have no clear understanding and warnings to the Pharisees do not come to mind as if they were addressed to us. Even in a life that thanks God, it is only if and when there is a dedication on the level of a disciple of the Lord and the dedication to give up everything for him, whose heart will humble himself, deny himself before the Lord, and follow the Lord, then it will be a sacrifice that pleases God. We cannot help but to feel once again, that the Lord's demand of devotion from us is ultimately for our blessing. Chapter 26
Reward and Punishment Among the ideas in which Christians will not commit to giving their all to, is the idea that there is no greed for reward. There are many people who say that, I know that if I surrender more in this world and dedicate more and live more for God, I know that obviously I can enjoy more rewards in heaven. However, I don't really want to be so jealous of the future reward. However, when Jesus came to this world, he spoke a lot about a reward in heaven. In particular, he preaches in Matthew 6 regarding rewards in his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6 verses 1 to 5 Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew 6 verses 16 to 18 Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. These words, however, do not desperately come to us because our hearts do not feel an urgency for the situation where we do not receive the reward. When a prize is available for us to obtain, but there is no immediate date of arrival, we care less about the reward entirely. In our lives, we like to act for the purpose of others' perception of us. When we give alms or charity, we would feel good if other people recognized our goodwill. Even when we pray and live a life of faith, we are not completely free from the eyes of those around us. In the verses above, it is not said that God would punish such hearts, rather, the reward we would be receiving will be considered as something that is already received so there is no later reward to be expected. Even if we believe and know what is written in the Word, being in a situation where we have already received a reward in this world does not burden us. We also think, I'm not the only one. When I do justice, I want people to look at me. When I give alms, I want others to know my good works. Where can there be a person who does not want others to praise him for his hard work of faith? When we realize how much we need rewards, we realize how dangerous those thoughts are. Also, in Luke 12 verses 56 to 59, we are warned about the hypocrites. Hypocrites You can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Make peace with your adversary, yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. There is a contextual background that we should be aware of here. Jesus said that hypocrites have no reward because they have already been rewarded with worldly satisfaction. So, we can think that by not receiving a reward later, there would be no other problems or punishments left. However, it is not that simple. 
John 8 verses 21 to 24. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, because he says, Where I go you cannot come? And he said to them, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What we misunderstand here is our situation. It is said, You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Our original state is that we are born in sin, we are from beneath and we are of this world. So, in John 1, we are expressed as darkness. The Lord, who is the light, came to us, but it is explained that we did not receive the light because we, who are darkness, did not even recognize if we needed the light. John 1, 5, 9-11 And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It is in our original state that we do not know whether we are darkness, if light illuminates us, or if we need light. If we remain in the original state, we will inevitably die, as the Word says. You will die in your sins. Therefore, we need a reward. In other words, if we do not have a reward, then we will have our punishment. It is a punishment of death in our sin. For us, having no punishment is having a reward, and to have no reward is to have a punishment. Because we are sinners, our reward of eternal life will prevent us from being punished for our sins, which is destruction. If we fail to receive the reward of eternal life, however, we must ultimately pay the price for our sins. This is why John 3 verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sins that we inherently deserve. Therefore, without that grace, we have no choice but to die in our sins. Meaning, we have received and spent our reward in this world. A heart that does not long for a reward is a heart that does not know our original state. We forget that we are in no condition to refuse the reward of eternal life. When we face a situation that requires us to bear our sins, there is no one to bear the burden for us because it will strike us all catastrophically. We are in a situation where we should never do foolish things that waste our reward simply for us to be seen in the world. These foolish things will result in us having to bear our own sins ourselves. Chapter 27 God's Sovereignty In the last chapter, we discussed that remaining in our original state will inevitably lead us to death. The characteristics of the heart that refuses to fully dedicate its entire life to God, along with the mind that does not care about receiving a reward, together cannot be a mind when we know our original state. Continuing to live our lives in our original state determines that we are destined to perish without the reward of grace. One of the other reasons in which Christians do not fully dedicate themselves to God is due to their belief that everything is under the sovereignty and providence of God, working by the absolute control of God according to God's plan, speaking about what God has predestined. It is impossible to deny this conception of the sovereignty and providence of God. When we present ourselves before Him in the kingdom of heaven, 
We are sure that we will be moved and grateful for the love of God that has given us grace by working mightily in our lives in His sovereignty and providence. When we meet our Heavenly Father, who has blessed us with great love and grace, we are sure that we will give thanks and praise, declaring that it was all God's grace, God's guidance, and God's work. When we meet the Lord with a perfect perspective and perfect view, however, it is very evident that we will glorify God with such gratitude for His sovereignty and providence. We also know very well that without God's perfect viewpoints in this world, the thought that everything is already determined in the sovereignty and providence of God, such the many sins of pride, indolence and life without faith have been brought to fruition. So in view of this situation, the truth of God's sovereignty and providence is used to become an obstacle for those of us who do not have a perfect understanding and perfect perspective when drawing near to God. Until we are before God, incorrectly using the truth of God's sovereignty and providence would be something that displeases God. This would rather be something that pleases Satan, who wants us to fall. From the lives of Christians who claim to have received special grace in the sovereignty of God, who say they are very grateful to God for the providence and predestined grace, and those who live with pride of being chosen by God, we can see the exalted heart of the Pharisees rather than the heart bearing the fruit of life. We see the fruit of the heart of hypocrisy, instead of the fruit of whom the Lord lives and manifests in them. We see the heart that wants to increase the same as the Lord increases, not the heart that says, He must increase, but I must decrease, John 3 verse 30. As proclaimed by John the Baptist. If so, we should think about it. What kind of reasoning led to such a misunderstanding? Would it be very important to recognize and reflect upon which areas of our life need to refocus on God in light of truth? By doing so, we can move forward with the will that pleases God. The following verses of the Bible are what Christians use to explain the sovereignty and providence of God. Exodus 33 verse 19 Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Romans 9 verses 14 to 15 What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. Apostle Paul's words in Romans 9 cited Exodus 33 referring to when God spoke to Moses while particularly showing him the glory of God. It is the verse in the Bible that understands that receiving mercy from God, receiving compassion from God, and being loved and hated by God is God's sovereignty. When we understand the verse above, however, we do not realize that we think of God who is the subject of mercy and compassion, at our level. At our level, the decisions we make at our own discretion may be biased, and we may misinterpret or make the wrong decisions by not understanding correctly. We may favor one side for no reason and change our minds over time. At the level of God, however, He does not do anything contrary to the words He has proclaimed. God has a complete understanding of our hearts, thoughts, and actions, and He does not lean to one side or show partiality because God is just. So when God calls them to be merciful, we can fully recognize and accept that they are truly worthy of God's mercy according to God's words and His character. Considering Psalm 103 verse 13. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The Lord will have compassion on those who fear him, 
because those who fear him are worthy of God's compassion according to God's word and God's character. This is the sovereignty of God. Considering Isaiah 55 verse 7. Let the wicked abandon his way, and the unrighteous person his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Those who return to the Lord will have the compassion and pardon of God according to God's word and God's character. This is the sovereignty of God. Considering 2 Chronicles 15 verse 2. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him, but if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Those who seek God will find him because, according to God's word and God's character, those who seek God are worthy of finding God. Those who abandon God will be abandoned by God because those who abandon God deserve God's abandonment according to God's word and God's character. This is the sovereignty of God. Considering 1 Samuel 2 verse 30. For those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be insignificant. Those who honor God will be honored by God because those who honor God are worthy to be honored by God according to God's word and God's character. Those who despise God will be insignificant because those who despise God deserve to be made insignificant according to the word of God and the character of God. This is the sovereignty of God. Considering Psalm 145 verse 20. The Lord watches over all who love him, but he will destroy all the wicked. God will protect those who love him as they are worthy of his protection, but God will not consider those who do evil as worthy of God's protection, so they will be destroyed. This is the sovereignty of God. Because God is a God who faithfully keeps his word for all eternity, he is an unchanging God. He is just. So when God says, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. There can be no doubt but the full recognition and acceptance that those who receive mercy from God will be truly worthy of receiving mercy in light of the word, and those who receive compassion will be truly worthy of receiving compassion in light of the word. Now, we must look back at ourselves with a detailed understanding of the standards and justice of God's sovereignty and providence. It is not biblical or correct to think that I have been chosen by God, who has the mercy of God, even though I do not fear God and I have a desire to be accepted by the world. It is not biblical or correct to think that I have been chosen by God, who has the grace of God, even though I have no desire to abandon my people-centered life and my desire to be recognized by people or return to God. It is not biblical or correct to think that I have been chosen by God to be favored, even though my heart is filled with worldly desires and I do not have a sincere heart to honor God alone with my whole life. It is not biblical or correct to think that I have been chosen by God to receive God's blessing, even though I do not serve God with all my heart and I do not place the importance of honoring God as my greatest value. It is not biblical or correct to think that I have been chosen by God to be loved by God, even though I do not live a life of loving and serving God with all my heart, mind, and soul. The day we stand before God, we are so confident that we will praise and give thanks for the grace that God has given us to guide us not to be deceived by Satan. We will praise His sovereignty, which guides us not to be proud of believing that we have already received the predetermined grace, and which leads us to obey the Word of God and live a life that fears God. Chapter 28 Sin of Adultery 
In John 8, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman caught in fornication over to Jesus. They asked Jesus by saying that according to the Mosaic law, a person caught in adultery should be stoned, but what would Jesus do in this case? Jesus said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. John 8 verse 7 Then to the woman who committed adultery, Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go! From now on do not sin any longer, John 8 verse 11. However, in Matthew 12 verse 39, when the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign, Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves a sign, and so no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Jesus referred to them as the adulterous generation. Also, Revelation 17 verse 5 says, And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It explains that the definition of adultery is friendship with the world. Additionally, in the Old Testament, God proclaimed to the people, who do not love God but have a heart towards the world, that they had committed adultery. 1 Chronicles 5 verse 25 but they were untrue to the God of their fathers and prostituted themselves with the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. Hosea 5 verses 3 to 4 I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me, because now, Ephraim, you have been unfaithful, Israel has defiled itself. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. For a spirit of infidelity is within them, and they do not know the Lord. Jeremiah 13 verse 27 As for your adulteries and your lustful nayings, the outrageous sin of your prostitution. On the hills and the field, I have seen your abominations. Woe to you, Jerusalem! How long will you remain unclean? What we want to understand through the preceding verses is to know the correct understanding of the sins of adultery that God would be judging in the last days. As we talked about in the previous chapters, one of the characteristics of hypocrites is that they interpret the spiritual truth and inner understanding that God wants us to realize outwardly and superficially. They only physically change its outer appearance, so that they do not understand the true meaning and make it impossible to receive grace. However, the same is true of adultery. In Luke 18 verse 11, we can find the content of the Pharisee's prayer. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Considering that he prayed and proclaimed that he is not like those who commit adultery, we can see that the pride in not committing physical adultery was expressed in the prayer. Regarding the prayer of the Pharisees, who were proud of not committing adultery, Jesus said that his prayer was not justified. Jesus also referred to the Pharisees as the adulterous generation several times. He intended to point out that due to hypocrisy, we focus only on physical and external things while failing to realize the message of true inner grace, even on the sin of adultery. In this book, we study the Bible to know how to come out of the authority that opposes God, who will be condemned when Jesus returns. That authority is expressed as the mother of the prostitutes. Therefore, it would be important to clearly understand the sin of adultery and how to prevent sharing their sins. 
Throughout the previous chapters, we have shared the contents of the Old Testament about God's call to people to return to God and telling Israel that they had committed adultery. What God wants is explained in detail in Deuteronomy 10 verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? The same content can be found in many places in the Old Testament. What God wants is for us to turn away from a life that seeks to be recognized by the world with worldly values. Instead, He wants for us to live a life that only fears God and loves Him with all our body, mind, and hearts. He expressed life otherwise, as adultery. In other words, a life that does not fear God but the world and people. A life that does not seek the approval of God, but the approval of the people and the exaltation of the world. A life that does not live in the eyes of God, but lives consciously in the eyes of the world. That is the life of adultery. In other words, a life of hypocrisy is a life of adultery before God. This is why the Bible expresses the power that will be judged in the last days as the mother of prostitutes, which was described as committing fornication and adultery with the world. This is why it was said that the punishment for the opposing forces of Jesus in the last days is described as a place with hypocrites, Matthew 24 verse 51. If we do not live in the eyes of God, but in the eyes of the world while wanting to be recognized in the world, it means that we have not yet come out of her. Thus, we are committing adultery. In the Bible, there are many verses about God's warning not to commit adultery, but I did not even realize that those words are directed to me. Upon reading the words about the punishment of adulterers, I never thought that such judgment could come upon me. Even with so many warnings that were repeatedly proclaimed throughout the Bible, I did not think of it as a warning message directed at me. Still wishing for the best in the world. Still wanting to be recognized by the people. Still fearful of the world and not living boldly by faith. Revelation 2 verses 21 to 22. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. When we are given the opportunity to repent, we must become those who repent of our fornication so that we can obtain the grace to receive mercy from God. Chapter 29 to obtain eternal life in Old Testament times. Throughout the previous chapters, we discussed the tremendous love, patience, and goodness that God had for us through His covenants. We admired the greatness of God, which opened the way to eternal life for us, bound by the curse of death and broken through the new covenant. Recognizing the work that God performed through the new covenant, however, does not appear in the lives of Christians. We have had time to reflect on the current state of Christians in the Bible through the last few chapters. Looking at whether our current state of devotion is acceptable in the light of God's Word, we further highlighted which areas of our lives required repentance and the return to God. In the midst of the work of salvation that God has accomplished through the covenants, I would like to review the areas where we are not enjoying the grace of God's completed work due to the fact that we do not have the correct understanding, according to the Word. By taking the time to understand them correctly, we are able to fully enjoy the grace of the new covenant. God's project of salvation was completed through God's covenants. It was through God's complete devotion and sacrifice for us that He provided the blessing of attaining eternal life for man. 
Because there was originally no way for man to attain eternal life because of the curse of eventual death, it will be very important for us to understand who and how one can obtain eternal life. For eternal life, we know that it can be obtained through faith in Jesus. If so, what standard was established for God's people before Jesus came to this world? What kinds of people could enjoy the blessing of eternal life? Jesus said in Matthew 22 verse 32, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Through this verse, we can clearly see that God provided the blessing of eternal life even to those who lived before Jesus came to the world. We will take a look at God's standards for giving eternal life to those who lived before Jesus' coming. We will then take the time to apply those standards to those who lived after Jesus' coming. Although God commanded the Israelites to live in fear and dependence on God along with circumcision as a physical sign of God's people, disobedience continued. Disobedient people then become those who were not in the will of God. The Bible further talks about eternal blessing explaining that those who will receive such blessings are the righteous, and the wicked will not receive eternal blessings. Psalm 37 verse 29, The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Psalm 112 verse 6, For he will never be shaken, the righteous will be remembered forever. Proverb 10 25, When the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. Proverb 10 16, The wages of the righteous is life, the income of the wicked, punishment. Proverb 10.30 The righteous will never be shaken, but the wicked will not live in the land. Psalm 118 verse 15 The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord performs valiantly. Psalm 112 verse 6 For he will never be shaken, the righteous will be remembered forever. Psalm 1 verse 6, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Before the arrival of Jesus, the way to receive the blessing of eternal life revealed in the word was not to be wicked, but to become righteous. Jesus even said the same regarding the blessings and curses of the wicked and the righteous for eternity. Matthew 13 verses 49 and 50 so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25 verse 46 And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Therefore, the way to receive eternal life is to become righteous. So by looking at what kinds of people were called righteous in the Old Testament and what they had to do to become righteous, we will see what to find God's standard for those to whom God gives the blessing of eternal life. First of all, we will check how righteousness is defined in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 23 verse 6 In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely, now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jeremiah 33 verse 16 In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Psalm 24 verses 5 to 6 He shall receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. Hosea 10 verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Righteousness, as God defines, is God himself. 
The definition of righteousness is explained in the preceding Bible verses which state that the Lord is our righteousness and that because only God is righteous. Righteousness is something that must be obtained from God and must be bestowed upon us. Knowing that righteousness belongs to God, we need to know how God makes people righteous. Deuteronomy 6 verse 25 Then it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, as He has commanded us. Righteousness is recognized when we keep God's commandments. In the same chapter, Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 to 5, the commandments to the people of Israel have been explained. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Meaning that although we are not righteous, However, when we love, believe, and follow God with all our mind and heart, it will be recognized as our righteousness. Proverbs 15 verse 9 The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness. The previous verse explains that although we are not righteous, those who follow God who is righteous will receive God's love and not be considered wicked. Ezekiel 18 verse 9 If he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. Explained above, following God's commandments and obeying them is the path to righteousness. After all, it is because we are sinners that we have no choice but to be wicked when following our will. Since God is just, if we follow God's will and His word, He recognizes us as righteous. His righteousness rescues us from the curse so that we can receive the blessing of I shall surely live. Proverbs 21 verse 21 He who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. This verse also clearly tells us that those who do not seek our will but rather the righteousness and mercy that belong only to God, will eventually receive life, righteousness, and honor. Habakkuk 2 verse 4 Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk's words, just shall live by his faith, are frequently quoted in the New Testament. As explained above, we cannot be righteous. God alone is our righteousness. The only way He recognizes us as righteous is when God recognizes our faith as our righteousness. Our faith is to love and follow God with all our body, mind, and strength. Through the Word, we learned about how one receives eternal life during the times of the Old Testament. Ultimately, it means loving and following God with all our heart and our mind deemed by God as righteous. Those who do not love or follow God as commanded would be recognized as wicked. In the last days, when judging between the righteous and the wicked, the righteous will have eternal life while the wicked will be punished forever. No matter what time we live in, we cannot help but praise God for His righteousness and love. Chapter 30 To obtain eternal life in New Testament times In the age of the New Testament, we know that we have to believe in Jesus to receive eternal life. As we look at the difference between receiving eternal life by believing in Jesus and receiving eternal life as those who lived in Old Testament times, we would like to know the great will of God that He has shown us through the history of the salvation. When we claim to believe in Jesus, what do we so precisely mean that we believe in? It is certain that when we have a solid understanding and clear recognition of what we believe, our faith will be firmer. When Jesus explained about eternal life, he often discussed what to believe and how to believe. 
John 5 verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 5 verses 38 to 40. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 12 verses 44 to 45. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. John 16 verse 30. Now we are sure that you know all things, and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Looking at the preceding verses, we can see that faith in Jesus is completely inseparable from faith in God who sent Jesus. Jesus goes on to explain that we can have eternal life by believing in God, who sent him into the world. Even when Jesus was asked how to obtain eternal life, Jesus turned our minds to God and explained the way to achieve eternal life that God has given us. Luke 10 verses 25 to 28 And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Throughout the Old Testament, God continued to require people to circumcise their hearts, fully love God, fear him, and also love their neighbor. The law that Jesus was talking about here was not necessarily a commandment to be ceremonially followed, but rather the faith and love God really required of all their hearts. When Jesus spoke of eternal life, he directed our hearts and minds to be in line with loving and fearing God. John 17 verses 2 to 3 As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 6 verses 38 to 40 For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 5 verses 38 to 42 But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men. But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. Jesus explains the history of salvation through the depiction of God's works and highlights his will as the most important of the work of salvation. He proclaims that the will of God is for all who sees the Son and believes in him to have eternal life. Through God's great love, God created a way for people to attain eternal life, sending Jesus to solve the problems of our sins. So, Jesus explains that eternal life is knowing and recognizing the only true God whose great deeds brought Jesus Christ sent by him. Therefore, without believing and loving God, we cannot recognize the person sent by God. Instead, we will reject him. Those who believe and love God can receive and believe in Jesus. When we say that we receive eternal life by believing in Jesus, 
we include the understanding and gratitude for God's work of salvation by sending Jesus an understanding of the work Jesus performed for our sins. As discussed earlier, God continued the work of salvation by forming covenants with people who, due to the curse of death, could never receive eternal life. God's proclamation of the new covenant brought forth His Son to carry our sins in our place. Jesus spoke words that connected the shedding of His blood and the fulfillment of the new covenant. Matthew 26 verse 28 For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Mark 14 verse 24 And He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Luke 22 verse 20 Likewise he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The content of the New Testament continues to explain that Jesus is the one sent by God to be sacrificed, fulfilling God's new covenant. In this way, believing in Jesus means acknowledging, giving thanks, and trusting in the fulfillment of the promise of God. Furthermore, the gift of eternal life through God's new covenant is finally fulfilled through Jesus because of the great love of God. Likewise, the Bible explains that the way to obtain eternal life proclaimed through the Old Testament is not denied by the new way of obtaining eternal life through Jesus, but the commandment of such law is fulfilled. Matthew 5 verse 17 do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. It is not the law that is destroyed, but it is for us who only keep the law externally and do not keep the law in our hearts. The sacrifice of Jesus uncovers the true meaning of the law, to build a relationship of perfect faith and love with God, which establishes the fulfillment and perfection of the law. Reading over the expression in the book of Revelation, it is well understood that the way to eternal life in both the Old and New Testaments cannot be separated. Revelation 14 verse 12 Here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In this verse, the saints are described as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The path to eternal life, in the Old Testament, is keeping God's commandments, and in the New Testament, the path to eternal life is believing in Jesus, used here to define the saints. Revelation 12 verse 17 And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the last days, those who will fight against anyone who opposes God were also described as expressing both the Old and New Testament's requirement of faith. Those who will fight on God's side are illustrated as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Upon seeing the depictions of the saints in the book of Revelation, we could confirm with certainty that our proclamation of faith in Jesus, followed by His command to love, trust, and depend on God with all our mind, strength, and heart, firmly establishes the way to eternal life through both the Old and New Testaments. In the book of Revelation, there are verses which describe the perfected completion of the new covenant that God proclaimed. The content of new covenant proclamation is described in Jeremiah 31 verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Furthermore. In Revelation 21 verses 3 to 7, the fulfillment of the new covenant is described. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. 
God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The above words describe the history of the project of salvation through God's covenants that have been fulfilled and completed. In New Testament times, we receive eternal life through faith in Jesus. However, that faith in Jesus includes believing in God's work of salvation that has been accomplished throughout the history of all mankind. Includes keeping the law to love and follow God with all your heart and soul, who even sent his Son. Includes receiving God's grace by acknowledging that we were bound by the curse of death and had no way of obtaining eternal life. Includes dedicating a life that only fears God without fear of the world. Chapter 31 the Criterion to Receiving the Grace Through the previous chapters, we discussed the story of salvation that God has unfolded, transcending the times of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the way to attain eternal life through it. No matter what time frame or era we live in, if someone does not love or fear God, he will not recognize the one whom God sent. Therefore, he will not receive the one whom God had sent. Ultimately, he will not be able to receive the blessing of eternal life. If we do not understand God's heart and fully understand God's intentions, we continue to misunderstand God. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. It says that God sees is our loyal heart towards God, and the object is people all over the whole earth. However, there are many Christians who think that grace was no longer granted to the Jews following Jesus' arrival. Instead, they believe the grace was transferred to the Gentiles. However, the Bible does not say that. Acts 2 colon 5, 37 to 41. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about three thousand were added to their number that day. Above is the story of how 3,000 people were baptized and believed in Jesus upon hearing Peter's sermon in Acts 2. However, it was the Jews who came to believe in Jesus, and they are described as God-fearing Jews. In other words, it is not that grace did not come to Jews, but rather that grace did not come to hypocritical Jews. Grace did come to God-fearing Jews. Acts 13 verse 43 When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. This verse explained that there were many Jews and devout converts to Judaism who were believers, 
following Paul and Barnabas. It explains that the Jews were not excluded from receiving grace, and those who feared God believed and followed Jesus. Acts 9 verse 31 Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Acts 14 verse 1 At Iconium Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Acts 19 verse 10 This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Acts 19 verse 17 When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. These verses explain how in the New Testament times, Jews also enjoyed the blessing of receiving eternal life through faith in Jesus by believing in him. The story of Cornelius, as we may know well, is found in the book of Acts. Acts 10 verses 1 to 2 At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Acts 10 verse 22 And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Cornelius was not a Jew. He did not even know Jesus. However, he was a God-fearing man. As we have discussed in previous chapters, fearing God means fearing only God and not fearing men. They are those who live in God's eyes and seek God's approval, not the people's approval. We can see that for Cornelius, who feared God and followed God completely, God gave him the blessing of hearing the gospel and believing in Jesus by having Peter summoned through an angel. When Peter saw that Cornelius had received his grace, he said this. Acts 10 verses 34 to 35 Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. In other words, the Jews who opposed Jesus were those who wanted to be exalted by men and lived by seeking the approval of the people. They were people who feared the world before God. So Jesus cursed them and called them hypocrites. Meaning, hypocrisy was the reason for not receiving God's grace and being excluded from the blessing of receiving eternal life. Those who were not hypocrites and lived completely in the eyes of God, regardless of whether they were Jews or Gentiles, all enjoyed the same grace. How long we have served the church, how much knowledge of the Bible we have, how much we have prayed, and how many miracles we have performed are certainly not the criteria for receiving the grace of eternal life from God. Whether we fear God in every moment and live without fear of the world, whether we seek God's approval instead of human approval, whether we live in God's eyes without worrying about people's eyes. This is the true criterion for receiving the grace that God is pouring out. Chapter 32 The Definition of Faith It is said that if we have faith, we can move mountains. It is said that if we have faith, nothing is impossible. It is also said that without faith it is impossible to please God. All Christians say that they believe in Jesus, and their belief in Jesus means having faith, but as promised in the Bible, the fruits of faith do not appear. In the previous chapters, we discussed that believing in Jesus includes believing in all of God's work of salvation, 
guidance, and love, as well as our responses to such love and sacrifice. In this chapter, I decided to look for the correct definition of faith. Because in James 2 verse 19 says, You believe that there is one God. Good! Even the demons believe that and shudder. Although demons know God better than we do, it cannot be considered true faith. It is important to find the definition of faith in the Word and check to see whether faith we have is the true faith that pleases God. First, I decided to verify the definition of the word faith in the Old Testament. Since the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek, the words are different. I first searched for its meaning in the Old Testament, which explained faith, and then expanded my understanding to the New Testament. By the way, several words were used to express faith in the Old Testament. First, I decided to look up the meaning of faith that is used in the passage where Abraham was deemed righteous because he believed in God. It is a verse that is quoted to explain faith in the New Testament. The original word is aman, which means to be firm, to support, to believe, to trust, to be loyal, to be faithful, and to be sure. Below are the words in which this word is used. Genesis 15 verse 6 Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Numbers 12 colon 7 But this is not true of my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. 1 Samuel 2 verse 35 I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Isaiah 7 verse 9 The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Next, I decided to look at the word used in the book of Habakkuk, which says, The just shall live by faith. This verse is also quoted in the New Testament when explaining faith. Here, the word amuna is used, which means steadfastness, faithfulness, loyalty, and trust. Below are the words in which this word is used. Habakkuk 2 verse 4 Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Jeremiah 5 verse 1 Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, see now and know, and seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Proverbs 28 verse 20 A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Psalm 119 verse 30 I have chosen the way of truth, your judgments I have laid before me. In the following content, I looked at the word that God used to express Jeremiah's faith, in which God promised Jeremiah that he would surely be saved because he believed in God. Here, the word betach is used, which has the meaning of boldness, trust, and certainty. Below are the words in which this word is used. Jeremiah 39 verse 18 For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. 1 Chronicles 5 verse 20 and they were helped against them, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer, because they put their trust in him. Psalm 13 verse 5 But I have trusted in your mercy, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Proverbs 3 verse 5 Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding.
I can't help but feel that the meaning of the words used for faith in the Old Testament is different from the meaning I originally had. Among the following meanings of firmness, steadfastness, loyalty, faithfulness, and trust expressed in the Old Testament, the meaning of maintaining a mind that is not moved to the end, not a momentary heart, was clearly expressed. Now, I looked up the word for faith in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the word that describes faith in Abraham, the word that describes faith in Habakkuk, and the word that describes the ancestor's faith of Old Testament faith, explained through the book of Hebrews, were all used together with a single word. It is the word pistuo which means to believe, to have faith. Through my inherent understanding of the word and by looking at the message of faith that is used throughout the Bible, the definition of faith, which was once not clearly understood, appears clearer. Since everything in the New Testament was expressed with the word faith, explained as believing and having faith, I did not have a clear understanding of what it means to believe. It was difficult to have a clear conception of what it is like to have faith. However, through the many expressions of the word explained in the Old Testament, we can now understand what faith is. Faith is steadfastly choosing the invisible God over the visible world. Faith is having a determined heart with the decision of life of choosing God and following God to the end. Faith is having an unshakable heart that does not turn its eyes to the world and remains on God's side until the end. Faith is standing firm in the promise of God without being swayed by the values and influences of the world. Faith is committing to living a life that responds to love, knowing the sacrifice and love that God has made to give us eternal life. Faith is dedicating a life that does not fear the world, but faithfully fears only God. Faith is pledging myself completely to the invisible God. Chapter 33 Repentance I thought I was a believer, but I can't help but realize that I don't have faith. I thought I was a Christian, but only those who became disciples of Jesus were Christians, but not me. I thought that I had already obtained eternal life, but my faith was not described as the faith to obtain eternal life. I thought I loved God, but I was an adulterer who lost my heart to the world. I thought I was a God-fearing person, but I was a hypocrite who feared the world. Now that we need to repent, restore, and have true faith, it is important for us to find out what it means to repent, how to do it, and what kind of repentance pleases God. Even for the word repentance, the explanation of the term in the Old Testament and in the New Testament was different. First, I decided to find out the meaning of the word repentance. Repentance in the Old Testament uses the word shub, which means to return and to turn back. Below are the Bible verses that use this word. Psalm 7 verse 12. If he does not turn back, he will sharpen his sword. Genesis 3 verse 19. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Genesis 18 verse 10. I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Numbers 10.36 Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Deuteronomy 30 verse 2 And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice, according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. The meaning of the word that represents repentance in the Old Testament was so different from the meaning of repentance I had thought of. I had to ponder about the meaning of this word. When we think of repenting, we conceptualize images of regretfulness, asking for forgiveness, and agreeing not to do it again. However, 
I was puzzled by the lack of such expressions of the word repentance in the Bible. I decided to find the original meaning of the word repentance in the New Testament. The word metaneo means to think differently after or after a change of mind. As I searched for the meaning of repentance through the Old and New Testaments, I came to think that the word repentance reveals two positions, where we are now and where we must go back, the place of my current thoughts and the place where my changed thoughts should be. Now that there is a clear line separating the two positions in the meaning of repentance, it is easier to understand. It is to completely turn around from the position where I thought, this is good enough, to the position where I put everything on God and stand firm. It is to completely turn around from the position where I seek the recognition of the world, to the position where I seek approval from God who gives eternal life and I stand firm. It is to completely turn around from the position where I look for God to solve my worldly problems, to the position where I recognize the true value of eternal blessings, give up everything to follow God, and stand firm. It is to completely turn around from the position where I wanted to be exalted because of God, to the position where I only want God to be exalted by me, being humbled, and standing firm. It is to completely turn around from the position where I was reluctant to give up everything and dedicate myself to God, to the position where I dedicate all my body, mind, will, and strength to love God and follow Him, and stand firm. Chapter 34 Baptism In the last chapter, we talked about repentance. However, when we deal with the word of repentance, the same word that follows it is the word of baptism. Mark 1 verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke 3 verse 3, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke 3 verses 7 to 8, then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. It can be clearly seen that repentance and baptism are directly related. Thus, it is impossible to be baptized without true repentance. Then, we should take the time to examine the relevance of baptism to us who have repented, who have turned completely from where we once were to where we have dedicated our lives to fear God and stand firm in our faith. Romans 6 verses 3 to 8 Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. John 12 verses 24-26 most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. The words of John 12 explain the message of life that is impossible to understand in this world, so Jesus used the parable of the seed to explain its meaning. It is content that has been shared multiple times in the previous book, as well as in previous chapters. 19. In this world, death means end, death means disappearance, death means defeat, 
death means no hope, and death means no remaining opportunities. When we look at the message of the seed, however, the seed must die to germinate. It must die to grow and it must die to bear fruit, so it must die to have hope. Since we are innately so full of worldly thoughts, messages different from those of the world do not reach our minds. However, the seed message is the most central message that Jesus explained and demonstrated to us throughout his life. When the Lord came to this world in the form of a seed and died, the way of resurrection was opened. As a result, many people were able to enjoy the gift of the resurrection to eternal life, and this was open to bear much fruit. By understanding the meaning of the message of a seed, we can then understand the meaning of the life of Jesus. As long as the seed does not rot and die, regardless of how long time passes, it will still remain as a single grain, however, when it rots and dies, it bears many fruits. In those fruits that were produced, there are many other seeds. Because Jesus became a seed that rotted and died, we are brought to bear as the fruit of Jesus. There are seeds in our fruit, and as those seeds rot and die, we can bear many fruits that continue to produce more fruit with seeds. Therefore, baptism is represented by the life of Jesus who lived as a seed becoming our life. Romans 6 explains that with his death we are also buried, and by his resurrection, we are also resurrected. The reason Jesus was buried and resurrected was to achieve a life in the form of a seed in this world. So when the Word says that we must be buried with Him and rise with Him, it means that we must participate in the life of the seed of Jesus. Now, we can understand Jesus' standards set for His disciples. As we discussed in the previous chapters, when Jesus called others to be a disciple, He said, the words of John 12 explain the message of life that is impossible to understand in this world, so Jesus used the parable of the seed to explain its meaning. It is content that has been shared multiple times in the previous book, as well as in previous chapters. In this world, death means end, death means disappearance, death means defeat, death means no hope and death means no remaining opportunities. When we look at the message of the seed, however, the seed must die to germinate. It must die to grow and it must die to bear fruit, so it must die to have hope. Since we are innately so full of worldly thoughts, messages different from those of the world do not reach our minds. However, the seed message is the most central message that Jesus explained and demonstrated to us throughout his life. When the Lord came to this world in the form of a seed and died, the way of resurrection was opened. As a result, many people were able to enjoy the gift of the resurrection to eternal life, and this was open to bear much fruit. By understanding the meaning of the message of a seed, we can then understand the meaning of the life of Jesus. As long as the seed does not rot and die, regardless of how long time passes, it will still remain as a single grain. However, when it rots and dies, it bears many fruits. In those fruits that were produced, there are many other seeds. Because Jesus became a seed that rotted and died, we are brought to bear as the fruit of Jesus. There are seeds in our fruit, and as those seeds rot and die, we can bear many fruits that continue to produce more fruit with seeds. Therefore, baptism is represented by the life of Jesus who lived as a seed becoming our life. Romans 6 explains that with his death we are also buried, and by his resurrection, we are also resurrected. The reason Jesus was buried and resurrected was to achieve a life in the form of a seed in this world. 
So when the word says that we must be buried with him and rise with him, it means that we must participate in the life of the seed of Jesus. Now, we can understand Jesus' standards set for his disciples. As we discussed in the previous chapters, when Jesus called others to be a disciple, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In Luke 14 verses 26 to 27, being called to be a disciple of Jesus was an invitation to a life in which the seed rots to death and returns bearing fruit. In other words, the call for disciples to take up their cross, follow the Lord, and be baptized had the same meaning because to be baptized is to be buried with Jesus. So in the words about making disciples of Jesus, baptism is also explained. John 4 verse 1 Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Matthew 28 verse 19 Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord ascended to heaven, the life he had entrusted to his disciples was a life of repentance, to be baptized with a heart completely turned to God, to be buried with Jesus, to take up the cross in each moment, and to live a life of following the Lord while making Jesus' disciples. The life of taking up the cross and following Jesus, and the burial life in conjunction with the death of Jesus, is not an option, but rather an obligation. Because Mark 16 verse 16 says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. However, those who do not have the dedication to live a life that fears only God and those who do not love God to commit their lives to following the Lord cannot understand the fact that a seed cannot bear fruit without death. In this way, they cannot understand the will of God, and the Bible explains such a case as below. Luke 7 verse 30 But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Chapter 35 Baptism of the Holy Spirit As we examined God's works through covenants in the previous chapters, we discussed that it was by the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that God's project of salvation, which he provided throughout the history of humanity, was finally fulfilled. We looked at the works of Jesus that were performed for the fulfillment of the covenant up until the last chapter and saw the connection between the work of Jesus and the continued work of the Holy Spirit. Because God sent the Holy Spirit to us following Jesus' ascension back to heaven, so that the Holy Spirit continues to carry out the work of Jesus. The previous chapters discuss that looking back on Jesus' time of his ministry, the life he has entrusted to his disciples was a life of repentance. He told them to be baptized with a heart completely turned to God, to be buried with Jesus, to take up the cross at every moment, and to make disciples. Then, the gift that God sent to Jesus' disciples, who were to live the life that was entrusted to them, was the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 verse 38 Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 8 verse 20 But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Acts 11 verse 17 if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Acts 2 verse 38 explains that as a result of the work of Jesus, when we repent, be baptized, and receive the forgiveness of sins, 
we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. However, the promise to give the Holy Spirit as a gift to be with us is also a promise made with the New Covenant. The following covenant promises were fulfilled by sending us the Holy Spirit as a gift. Jeremiah 31 verse 33 But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 24 verse 7 Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. God fulfilled his promise that he will come and dwell with us forever in the hearts of God's people through the Holy Spirit. When people come to him, repent, have faith in Jesus, and are buried with Jesus, through the Holy Spirit with Jesus they will rise. So the life of those who have received the Holy Spirit is not the life we live, but the life the Lord lives in us. John 14 verse 17 The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Acts 1 verse 8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Romans 8 verse 9 But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. It is not a life of my level, but a life of God's level. It is so necessary that now we reflect upon the Word through our lives with a sincere heart. Have I really received the Holy Spirit, the gift of God? Does the Holy Spirit really dwell with me? Am I really living a life of testimony of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit? Am I really a man of Christ who has the Spirit of Christ? In this sense, we must look back to see how many misunderstandings and abuses regarding the presence of the Holy Spirit have occurred in the history of the Church. It was not through the Holy Spirit in me, but through the teachings of the Church, that I thought that the Holy Spirit was present in me. It is taught that to all those who profess to believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit has already come upon them. It is taught that if they have spiritual experiences and speak in tongues while praying, the Holy Spirit has already come upon them. It is taught that if those who prayed the sinner's prayer and accepted Jesus into their hearts, the Holy Spirit has already come upon them. It is even taught that the Holy Spirit has already come upon all the people of God, who believe they are Christians. However, our lives cannot see the fulfillment of the words of the Bible with such a manner of teaching. Galatians 5 verses 16 to 18 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. However, I don't know what is to be led by the Holy Spirit, and what is walking in the Spirit. John 16 verse 13 says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Even though I want to walk by the Holy Spirit, there is no work of the Holy Spirit in my heart to guide me so that I can follow. John 7 verses 38 to 39 says, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. However, I cannot understand how rivers of living water can flow from the heart, and what it is like to receive the Spirit. 
The reason we thought the Holy Spirit was already with us, despite having no evidence in our lives, was that this is what the Church says. Since people believe their teachings, we thought it would be okay to follow what everyone else thinks. As we learned while looking through God's works in the previous chapters, God cannot work in any way that is contrary to what He has said. He is also the one who works so that His words are fully fulfilled. God has been carrying out the project of salvation for us throughout the history of mankind, eventually sending Jesus to solve the problem of our unbreakable curse. God then sent the Spirit of God into our hearts, so that we would be led by the Spirit of God, instead of by the law, to complete fulfillment of God's covenant. Therefore, if living guided by the Holy Spirit is only understood on a religious or formal level, then the most important part of the history of God's salvation is lost. And that is what Satan intends. When we first repent by sincerely believing in Jesus and that He lives in us, it is a fact that the Holy Spirit will come upon us to be with us. This is so certain that there is no need to doubt it. We must be whom God said to be in His words. Therefore, we must clearly confirm whether our repentance, our faith, and our baptism are genuine. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Jesus who is in me is the Holy Spirit. When a person has the Holy Spirit within him, it is absolutely impossible not to know and recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's something we fail to further recognize. We are so ignorant to how much God cares about knowing and verifying the authenticity of our hearts. Through the Word, God has said so many times that He tests our hearts to know our true intention. The following are the verses about God testing our hearts. Genesis 22 verse 1 Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and said to him, Abraham. Deuteronomy 13 verse 3 You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Jeremiah 20 verse 12 But, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, and see the mind and heart. Judges 2 verse 22 So that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord, to walk in them as their fathers kept them, or not. Jeremiah 17 verse 10 I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Not only are the verses about testing our hearts, but also say that God searches, weighs, looks at, and sees our hearts. Knowing his interest, we can learn that God is a God who cares deeply about the sincerity of our hearts. The following verses speak on God searching our hearts. Proverbs 15 verse 3 the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9 As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Proverbs 24 verse 12 If you say, Surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Proverbs 21 verse 2 Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. When we talked about hypocrisy, we discussed that hypocrisy is living in the consciousness of the eyes of people, 
not of living in the eyes of God. We did not know that the eyes of God watches our hearts so intensely, tests whether our hearts love God with all our hearts, and observes and inspects the sincerity of our hearts. We never thought his attention was so focused on knowing the authenticity of our hearts. Now that we know the heart of God, it is understandable that there is no evidence of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives due to our belief in Jesus. God, who tests and inspects our hearts, will obviously know if my prayer of repentance comes from a truly humbled and contrite heart. Whether my dedication to loving only God and living for God comes from my sincere love for God, and if my sacrifices and my services to God are true faith to the kingdom of heaven. When there is true repentance, faith, and baptism, it is God who truly desires to pour out the gift of the Holy Spirit on us. Because Luke 11 verse 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I can now understand how much more God, who wants to give us the Holy Spirit, expects and waits for us to repent, believe in Him, and live the life of dying on the cross with Jesus. When we have true repentance, faith, and baptism in us, the Holy Spirit descends on us as God has promised. When the Holy Spirit comes to us, we have no choice but to know God's promise as fact. Those of us who are carnal now have different desires than those of the flesh. Desire is what the heart wants. In my self-centered heart, I now have a new heart that wants me to be humbled and only God to be glorified. Now, I have the heart to abandon the life that does not please God, but instead, live a life that pleases only God. Now, I have the heart that does not follow the desire of the flesh, but lives according to the will of God. With a new heart, I now praise the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 verse 33 which states, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Chapter 36 The Guidance of the Holy Spirit In the last chapter, we talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit into our hearts as the heart of God. However, I am curious as to how I don't know very much about the desires of the Holy Spirit. I have always tried to be sincere and kind, and I have never experienced any kind of realization from the light of darkness that can divide my heart and life. As we discussed in previous chapters, we, who have become sinners as a result of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, have hearts to think that we can have good works and a good heart within ourselves. Within the heart that thinks that I can honor God with a good heart, however, there hides a heart that believes exalting God will also exalt me with Him, instead of a heart that thinks I must be humbled and God must be exalted. It means that I have the heart to believe in God and live a good life in hopes of being blessed and exalted. When there is no repentance and no baptism, there is no true recognition as a sinner in darkness, and there is no desire to be crucified with Jesus before God who is our light. Therefore, there is no forgiveness of sins and no coming of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we cannot obtain eternal life at the level of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We can only obtain eternal life at the level of the fruit of the tree of life. It is a misconception that the heart of good works from the level of the tree of knowledge comes from the heart of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes and shines a light into our hearts, the hidden darkness is exposed, allowing us to come before God with a contrite heart. 
When the Holy Spirit comes to us with realization, our self-centered thoughts will be revealed. We will repent before God with a heart of mourning. When the Holy Spirit guides us, our carnal thoughts are illuminated. I desire to let go of myself at every moment and only follow God's will. However, humans possess a character completely opposite to that of God, whose character is always the same and absolute. God believes that when He comes upon us as the Holy Spirit, He becomes our God from that point on. This begins a relationship of true faith and love with His people. It is a starting point for God, but people think it is a point of completion. People say this, citing Ephesians 1 verse 13, Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. They think that they have already attained eternal life and the seal of possessing the kingdom of God. Believing that everything is complete, they believe in His Word and presence as a point of completion instead of a starting point. We cannot help but be surprised to see that our thoughts are so different and offensive from the thoughts of God. In the New Testament, there are many explanations for living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6 verses 3 to 7 Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. This is the explanation for the life of the cross. As discussed in the previous book and explained various times through the previous chapters, the whole message of Jesus' life is represented by the message of the resurrection, the message of the cross, and the message from the story of a grain of wheat. This is the message of revival. Through his own life, he sacrificed himself to die like a seed, but he then confirmed and showed us the result of being resurrected and bearing many fruits. Believing in Jesus includes the content of fully trusting in Jesus, who has accomplished the work of resurrection that overcomes death, and living the life of resurrection accomplished by Jesus. Choosing to die on the cross with Jesus is the essence of the life of revival. Therefore, Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. A life led by the Holy Spirit is a life of resurrection and a life of revival. Those who died on the cross like Jesus will not live for themselves, but will live according to the heart of Jesus who entered them. This is the desire of the Holy Spirit. It is living a life guided by what God wants, which is the life of faith. Romans 8 verses 5 to 8 For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 verses 12 to 14 Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, 
lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. A life led by the Holy Spirit is a life that lives according to the desire of the Holy Spirit that came into me to live according to the heart that God desires. In order to do so, the Bible commands us to keep letting go of my desire, letting myself die and choosing the heart that God desires in me. The Holy Spirit never compulsively manipulates us or oppressively guides us into making decisions in our lives. That is why we must willingly and lovingly make decisions which let only the desires of the Holy Spirit come true by letting go of ourselves at every moment. The following verse explains such a life. Romans 14 verses 7 to 8 For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. When we know that we are in darkness and moved by the grace of God that has given me eternal life, we do not follow the heart we desire. Rather, we live by the heart that the Holy Spirit desires in us. It is not to live for ourselves, but to live a life for God by putting away all our carnal desires. This makes the verse a reality saying. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 11 to 12 For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Philippians 2 verse 13 For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, we are those who have received the Spirit of God. The verse above explains that only the Spirit of God can know the things of God. Because we are now those who have received the Spirit of God, we can know the things of God. What God desires, the will that pleases God, is the desire of the Holy Spirit. It is the heart of the Holy Spirit that can be known when the desires of the flesh are laid down in us. For us who love God with all our body, mind, and will, God's desire becomes our desire. The verse further explains that God will work in us according to the desires of God put in my heart for his good pleasure. The desire in my heart when I wanted to please God would be fulfilled by God. It is God's will that is accomplished. In doing so, God expands his kingdom through us. This is the life of carrying the torch of revival. Chapter 37 Misconceptions about the Holy Spirit As discussed several times in previous chapters, one of the characteristics of hypocrisy is that we continue to understand the things that God considers valuable in their outward appearance, missing the truly important things. In life, there are many cases where even while following the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the most important things are overlooked by focusing attention and heart only on external things and external appearance. When the Holy Spirit came to us, the Spirit of God came to dwell in us, so, the various phenomena of God may appear in us. These are facts that are recorded in the Bible and many words about the power that are further revealed through the apostles. Furthermore, the Bible says that nothing is impossible for those who believe. Therefore, we believe God can work miracles at all times through the faith of those who are led by the Holy Spirit. What we are missing, however, is that we are only following the outward phenomena and we mistakenly follow the guidance that is not from the Holy Spirit. In the end, we are missing the true will of God that the Holy Spirit wants to come and fulfill. In the Bible, it is said many times that there will be such deceptions. 
Below are the verses on such warnings. Matthew 24 verse 11 Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Matthew 24 verse 24 For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Mark 13 verse 22 for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. What we can miss here is that even false prophets may not know that they are in the position of false prophets, and they continue to do their work under the impression they are doing it for God. Thus, it can deceive people. John 16 verse 2 says, They will put you out of the synagogues, Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Even in a situation where people kill God's people, as to think it is to serve God, those who oppose God do not realize that they are against God. Rather, they believe they are working for God. As mentioned in the previous chapter, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes were people who thought they were zealous for God by living for God with all their might. However, Jesus told the Jews who said that Abraham was their father. John 8 verses 42 to 44, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The statement above is very alarming. Jesus said to these Jews, who believe that they are descendants of Abraham, who physically keep the law, and live by the word all their lives, that their father is the devil. Their father, the devil, is a murderer, a liar, and the father of lies. He further says that they want to do the actions of the devil. Would they have ever imagined that they were the children of the devil? Would they have ever imagined that they would do things that the devil does? Would they have even thought that they were not children of God? Jesus said something truly unthinkable to them. But what Jesus said was true. They were hypocrites who wanted to be recognized by the world. Therefore, it is clear that they did not belong to God. Since we are all darkness and belong to God only when we come to the Lord who is light, it is true that they were in darkness, thus, they are truly the children of darkness. The only problem was that they were unaware of it. We should examine ourselves with the same standards. 1 John 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In the Word, we must review the content of how God wants us to prepare against such deceptions. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 to 10 The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. The verse above explains that there can be power, signs, and wonders even without the power of the Holy Spirit. So, such power, signs, and wonders should never become the standard by which to follow them. When we look at the word deception, as Jesus explained above, even the person who caused these signs and miracles may think they are working for God. Therefore, it is necessary to distinguish between those who have been buried with the Lord and are guided by the Holy Spirit in the work of resurrection, 
and those who cannot be saved because they do not receive the love of the truth. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15 For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. It is clear from the words above that we must remember that even the servants of Satan disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Hebrews 13 verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Even regarding those who taught and guided us in the word of God, the Bible tells us to consider the outcome of their conduct and then follow them. 2 Peter 2 verses 1 to 2 But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. As seen from the words above, it explains that false prophets and teachers are those who bring swift destruction upon themselves. However, the false prophets and teachers would not have done so if they had known that they would be suffering such destruction. Furthermore, the word destructive way means debauchery in the original language. In the end, this is a warning against those who affirm only theories without the cross. Those who do not want to deny the carnal desires on the cross, but still want to be seen as spiritual, will eventually not stand in the way of truth. A life led by the Holy Spirit is a life that fulfills God's desires while following God's heart, which is the desire of the Holy Spirit. However, a life led by the Holy Spirit is a life that can only be followed when we give up our physical desires. It is a life which Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It is a life of revival and a life carrying the torch of revival. No one in this world particularly likes to die. Hebrews 2 verse 15 says, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. As humans, we are all afraid to die. So, we have a heart to enjoy the benefits of being a child of God while excluding the situation where we have to die. That is how we become hypocrites. Just as Jesus could not bear fruit if he had not come to this world and died, we cannot participate in the work of the resurrection unless we die on the cross with the Lord. As humans we want to enjoy spiritual blessing without going through death. That is why we become false prophets and false teachers. When the Bible speaks about false prophets and false teachers, I thought that the message cannot be addressed to me. However, if I have not died on the cross but continue to lead other souls spiritually, then, I am a false prophet and a false teacher. When we fear God, we can put our physical things to death at any moment. Only then can we live a life led by the Holy Spirit. By that truth, we must discern false prophets and test our faith. The following Bible verse is about life without that discernment. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 11 to 12 And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in. Chapter 38 The Life of Faith Because I go to church, because I live by praying to Jesus, 
because I prayed to receive Jesus, because my whole family had been Christians for a long time, I thought I was living a life of faith. While studying the faith, however, God speaks through the words of the Bible and the life of pleasing God. I came to know that the way we Christians live our life of faith is very different from the way God presented in the Word. There was no fear of God. Because I did not know God well, I created God in the form of how I would like to believe in God. I did not realize God's heart and desires and rather, used God to fulfill my wishes and desires. Although there was nothing that God would be happy with in my life, I believe that I am a blessed child of God. I believe that I am God's chosen because I believe in Jesus. Moreover, there was no fear of Jesus' return because I thought I would be the one who will be sealed by God. As a result, my heart was not a poor and contrite heart, but rather a content and exalted heart. Now that I completely want to turn to God, I try to commit to a life led by the Holy Spirit where I die, and only the Lord lives in me. However, I realize that there are many things that are tied up in my life. I also come to realize that not only my heart but my relationships are also intertwined with things that are not God-centered. I have a vague feeling that I do not know how far and well I should organize these relationships which prevent me from growing closer to God. Also at this moment, I feel a sense of compromise. I feel that I can be devoted to God, but how can all the organizations and groups that I am affiliated with also be all God-centered? How can I completely come out of all my networks that are not God-fearing? The thought of compromising my situation continues. Now that I am able to discern, I can clearly know the non-God-centered aspects of the groups I belong to and how their teachings offend God. I also wonder if there is a need to cut off all my relationships associated with such groups. When I think of these compromises, I realize that my carnal desires, not the desires of the Holy Spirit in me, are trying to settle and build nests in my heart. Now, in order to reject the desires of the flesh on the cross and follow the desires of the Holy Spirit, I want to learn from the Word of God for this situation in the Bible. As I examined the words on the life of faith, however, a thought came to mind that it is not about being harmonious and loved, but about being hated and divided. In John 7 verse 7 Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Although Jesus did nothing wrong, he declared that the practices of the hypocrites were evil. For that reason, he was hated and even killed on the cross. Looking at this content, there was a way that Jesus could not have been hated so much. If Jesus had not revealed the sin covered by the hypocrites, there would be no reason for such hatred. Although they are evil on the inside, they pretend to be good on the outside. They try not to show their evil side while teaching the Bible, but when Jesus testified that their actions were evil, they hated Jesus so much that they wanted to kill him. In the end, they made Jesus die on the cross. Even now, the authority of the hypocrites is in a position that claims the vicar of Christ in an exalted position in the world as in the days of Jesus. However, the churches do not oppose this, but rather do good deeds together and unite, there is no hatred or persecution. We may think that it would be wise not to make a big deal in this situation. We can admit that they are darkness, but we do not make it known in order to avoid a situation filled with hatred and persecution. However, Things are not that easy. This is because light cannot belong to darkness. If I am of the light, 
I must come out of the influence of darkness. However, when there is a divided attempt when trying to get out of the darkness, we cannot help but be hated. Jesus explained such a situation. John 17 verse 14 I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The next verse is about how the world hates us because we don't belong to them. Also, it explains in detail why we can't help but be hated and unloved. John 15 verses 18 to 19 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It explains that because we do not belong to the world, we cannot receive their love, and because they hate Jesus, we will be hated too. However, there is something we want to confirm when we see this content. It is true that the authority of the hypocrites in his time tried to kill Jesus, but now, the authority of the hypocrites is that of the religious leaders established around exalting and praising Jesus. They do not persecute Jesus but praise him. But can we see them as the same darkness as the hypocrites of Jesus' day? At the time of Jesus, the authority of hypocrites were those who said they loved and feared God, but Jesus did not recognize them as such. John 15 verses 23 to 24 He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. Matthew 15 verses 7 to 8 Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What Jesus said to the authority of hypocrites is that they outwardly say that they love God, but on the inside, they do not love God but hate Him. The authority of the hypocrites today is no different. They say that they are followers of Jesus on the outside and they praise Jesus, but they respect Him with their lips, but they are not people who believe and follow Jesus in their hearts, because they are hypocrites. Those who decide to live the life of a disciple of Jesus should know that before making the decision to dwell in the light, we are bound to be separated from the darkness. When we do so, we will inevitably be hated. Therefore, Luke 14 verses 27 to 28 says, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? The life of carrying the cross and becoming a disciple of Jesus is a life of following the Lord even at the risk of life at all times. Before making the decision to live such a life, Jesus said to count the cost and then make a decision. If we live our lives in the light and proclaim darkness as darkness, we cannot avoid persecution. This is how it is explained in the Bible. Acts 14 verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Philippians 1 verse 29, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. We now know that suffering is inevitable and it is not an option, but a necessity. However, there is a reason we have no choice but to choose to live the life of discipleship and revival with joy. 
It is because of the eternal blessings, grace, and love that cannot be compared to the sufferings of this world. The words that confirm the reason are the following. Mark 10 verses 29 to 30. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 5 For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. 1 Peter 4 verses 13 to 14 But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Romans 8 verse 18 For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Because we know that. How precious is it that God will recognize the difficulties we have suffered because of him in this world. How much better would a sacrifice for God in this world be compensated with more than we have hoped and expected? Rather, I have no choice but to rejoice and be thankful that I have an opportunity to impress and please God. Chapter 39 The Two Terrifying Sins In this chapter, we will take a closer look at the two terrifying sins that Jesus himself explained to us. We will take this time to think about what he wants us to know through those messages and what attitude we should have to deal with such sins. The two very terrifying sins that Jesus spoke of were the sin of causing one to stumble and the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The reason these two sins are defined as terrifying sins is because of Jesus' explanation of their terrifying consequences. Regarding the sin of causing one to stumble, which is also expressed as cause to sin, Jesus says in Matthew 18 verse 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. It is a very terrifying sin because it means that the consequences of that sin would be worse than hanging a millstone around the neck and drowning in the sea. Regarding the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in Matthew 12 verse 32, Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. He also said in Mark 3 verse 29, But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. It is a terrifying sin because there is no possibility of being forgiven forever. So, recognizing the sin that punishes so extensively must be the sins that we really must stay away from. Because he has given us such attention to the terrifying details, it would be necessary to take some time to learn more about these sins the Lord wants us to be careful of. First, we looked at the sin of causing a stumble. The explanation of this sin is explained in three places, Matthew 18, Mark 9, and Luke 17. Below are the words of Matthew 18. Matthew 18 verses 6 to 9. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck, and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through whom the stumbling block comes. And if your hand or your foot is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you, 
It is better for you to enter life maimed or without a foot than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fiery hell. In the preceding section, the words marked in bold are the contents explained with the same word of the original language. That is, to cause a person to sin and stumbling blocks have the same meaning because they share the same word used in the original language. In the original language, to stumble is scandalizo, which means to stumble, to make one sin. However, it is difficult to understand how exactly I should be careful to not commit this sin. What does it mean not to stumble? I think I need a deeper understanding of this sin in order to know how to avoid it. However, when I came to understand the context in which this word was used, I could clearly see what the sin of causing a stumble was. The following verses deal with this case of the sin of stumbling. Matthew 16 verses 21 to 23 from that time Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and to be killed, and to be raised up on the third day. And yet Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but men's. The previous verse is what we shared in the previous chapter. When Jesus explained to his disciples that he would suffer and die, Peter told Jesus not to do so. This passage is Jesus rebuking Peter about what he had just said. Jesus said to Peter that he is a stumbling block. The word scandalizo is used here. Jesus then explains what the sin of stumbling block is. For you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but men's. Now I understand very clearly what the sin of a stumbling block is. The sin of stumbling is the sin of thinking of human things rather than the things of God. This is hypocrisy. If we do not live in the eyes of God, we will become a hypocrite. If we become a hypocrite, we will commit the sin of causing people to stumble. I could not help but realize once again how frightening hypocrisy is. Now, we will study for the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Since this is a sin that cannot be forgiven after committing it, I thought it would be very important to be alert and awake so as not to fall into this sin. The sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is also explained in three places, Matthew 12, Mark 3, and Luke 12. Below are the words of Matthew 12. Matthew 12 verses 24 to 35. Now when the Pharisees heard it they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men.
Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of Vipers How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. This is the content of the dispute between the Pharisees and Jesus. Again, Jesus said that they are the brood of vipers and that their words must be bad because they are bad. The Pharisees did not want to recognize Jesus as the Son of God because, as mentioned in the previous chapter, Jesus testified that their works were evil. So they hated Jesus. When they did not want to recognize Jesus as the Son of God, but Jesus had cast out demons with the Spirit of God, the Pharisees refused to recognize him as the Son of God by claiming the demons were expelled by Beelzebub, the Philistine God. Checking the words above stating, Brood of vipers! How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. We can understand that they are not guilty for what they just said. But from what they have in their hearts, they became guilty. As explained in the previous chapters, Jesus had said that the Pharisees were hypocrites and they became blind because of hypocrisy. Jesus said to the Pharisees so many times that they are blind. Jesus also said in Matthew 23 verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. It was explained in previous chapters that because they were blind and could not see and their spiritual understanding was darkened, they rejected grace. They end up being unforgivable because they were blinded to the point that they refused to be forgiven no matter how much God tried to forgive them. And now, I can better understand. Jesus said that the sin of the Pharisees was the sin of hypocrisy. He continued to warn us, saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke 12 verse 1 Even in the midst of this conflict, Jesus is speaking of the darkness that has accumulated in the hearts of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. However, by looking at the content of Jesus' dispute with the Pharisees above, we can understand the connection between the sin of hypocrisy and the unforgivable situation. The sin of hypocrisy is a sin that no one can be free from. Anyone can commit this sin at any time when we miss the eyes of God. Therefore, I was curious about the point where the sin of hypocrisy is serious enough to the point of not being able to be forgiven because of that sin. I could realize where the point of not being forgiven was through the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. When we commit hypocrisy, we will not be able to see correctly as Jesus had warned. So if our eyesight becomes so dark that we cannot even repent, we will never have a chance to be forever forgiven. If we become so blind that we cannot even repent because our eyes are so dark, we would be at a point where we would say blasphemies such as claiming God's deeds to be done by other gods. I cannot help but feel scared and tremble when I think about how many of these things are around us. When there comes a situation where negativity affects one's own organization, one's group, or one's church, they do not look at their own problems. No matter how God-centered the other party is, they will attack and criticize. 
Even when they try to cover up the problems of their own group and their church's doings, they say they are doing it for God. They oppose and criticize those who are actually speaking God-centered words. It is from these blind people where we now have to come out of. When Martin Luther called on to the Roman Church to return to faith, they called him a heretic and executed tens of millions of believers. The work of the Holy Spirit was defined as the work of evil forces by the Roman Church. It is very similar to what the Pharisees did to Jesus. Now, they claim that those divided due to the Reformation must repent and become one again. It is proclaiming that the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Reformation, is something that needs repentance. Indeed, their eyes are completely closed and they define God's work as Satan's work. The Christian churches, however, respond to such an offer and choose to become one with them. It is really terrifying to see how many things are being done that blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit right now. When our eyes can still see even just a little to be able to repent, we must be freed from that terrifying sin which is to obey the word, come out of her, my people. Chapter 40 Put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry. As we discussed in the previous book and the previous chapters, now is the time for the forces that oppose God to strive for the unification of people in their own power. They want these people to belong to them and ultimately be destroyed. Only those who have been sealed by God will not belong to those forces. It is according to the words of Revelation, where Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17 says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This verse is about the beast that God will eventually destroy. This beast is the one who opposes God and will make all people receive the beast's mark. And Revelation 9 verse 4 says, Only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. This content is that all those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads will eventually be harmed. In the end, we will receive either a mark from God or a mark from the beast, only one of the two. Those who receive the mark of the beast will enjoy the privilege of the benefits of living in this world, seeing the circumstances that facilitate buying and selling in the previous verse. Those who receive the mark of God will enjoy the privilege of not being punished by God. The explanation in the book of Revelation is that everyone in the world will receive one of these two marks. There is a lot of speculation focused on the outward appearance of this circumstance. However, we discussed many times that we as humans try to understand all situations only as external and physical entities. Thus, we end up missing the true spiritual and heart-centered messages that God wants to convey. Even through the words of the book of Revelation, given to us to prepare ourselves in the last days, we are only trying to understand the outward appearance. We are missing what God really wants us to know. So who will be the ones to receive the mark of God on their foreheads? For Christians, the words of the book of Revelation are not alarming, thinking that all who have accepted Jesus Christ would be sealed by God. In the Old Testament, however, there is content that explains exactly who will receive the mark of God upon his judgment. Throughout the Bible, the explanation of receiving the mark of God on the forehead is explained only in one place besides the book of Revelation. Ezekiel 9 verses 1 to 6 Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. 
and suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a rider's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the rider's inkhorn at his side, and the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill, do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. The preceding prophecy was given to the prophet Ezekiel. This is a detailed explanation of the time of God's judgment. In the previous text, we can see that those with the mark on their foreheads are clearly separated so that they are not harmed when people are judged. It is exactly the same as the content found in the book of Revelation. However, in that content, it is explained exactly who will receive the mark on the forehead. It is said, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. That is, those who received the mark of God on their foreheads were the ones who sigh and cry for the things of God. As I read those words, I could not help but admit that God is truly righteous and just. I could be convinced by the standards of His judgment that He really has no discrimination, that He truly searches our hearts. This is because those who sigh and cry for the things of God must be God-centered, so it is impossible for them to be self-centered. As human beings, things do not affect our minds when they are not related to us. It does not affect us when we are not in a situation where our interests are connected. We will sigh and cry only for our things or the things of our loved ones. We never sigh and cry for other people's things. It is impossible to sigh and cry when it is not about my things or my loved ones. We can feel sorry for other people's things, but we cannot sigh and cry. However, it is only when I love God, when I have the heart of the Holy Spirit, and when Jesus lives in me that tears of mourning flow from my heart for the detestable things that are being done before God. He who sighs and cries for the things of God is the one who gave up carnal desires and the desire of the Holy Spirit leads his heart who has been crucified with Jesus and Jesus lives in his heart, who loves God with all his body, mind, and heart. Now, according to the Bible, we know for sure how to obey his command, come out of her, my people. Together, we were able to confirm the fact that God has been continuously telling us a clear standard that no one can use as an excuse. Throughout this book, we have been thinking about what it's like to live a life of obedience to the words, Come out of her, my people. In the previous book, the answer to that question was found by looking through the undisclosed classical books left by the ancestors of the faith for hundreds of years. In this book, the answer was found in the words of the Bible. The conclusion we can now draw is the same as underlined in the previous book. In these last days, the only way to live a life prepared to meet the Lord without belonging to the authority that opposes God is through revival. The life that I die on the cross with Christ, and Christ lives in me. The life that I love God with all my heart and mind. 
The Life of Being a Mediator Instead of an Accuser by Loving My Neighbor as Myself I cannot help but admit that the content of the life of revival, shared in the previous book, is the same as the content of this book, where the will of God is searched throughout the Bible. Finally, I would like to share once again the words of the Bible that were shared in the last chapter of the previous book. Daniel 12 verses 1 to 3 At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I truly desire that we can all be wise so that we may shine like the brightness of the firmament, that we can be the ones who convert many to righteousness so that we can shine like the stars forever and ever. And I pray again, may all of us love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May all of us live the life of the Lord and the power of the cross. May all of us not stand on the side of Satan, but to stand on the side of God. May all of us have the blessing of enjoying eternal life in the kingdom of God. May all of us not become accusers, but become mediators. May all of us have a heart of revival and carry the torch of revival. May all of us shine like the brightness of the firmament and the stars forever and ever.